lovely to see so many of you here tonight. Um, so we will have, uh, there is nothing to report out of closed session. And we will now have um, a roll call, uh, open this open meeting and have a roll call. What did you think? Yes. Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. President Henry? Here. Director Swan? Here. Director Swan is here via teleconference. And you can hear us all right, Steve? I can hear you just fine, Willis. Okay, great. Um, so, first item on the agenda is um, any additions or deletions to the open session? I have none. Okay. Oral communications, um, it's five, you get five minutes. How many of you think you're going to want to talk? I might not be able to give you five minutes. Oh, not too many of you. You get five minutes. Uh, you may talk about anything that's not on the agenda. Um, so, who who wants to go first here? Larry, do you want to go first? Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Larry Ford Felton. Um, I think I'm going to get in the conversation about fire management when that comes up on the agenda. Yeah, you should wait for that. I will. Agenda I will. Speak. Yeah. And, yeah. And I put that in the in the eyes. Great. So I wanted to raise another issue. Um, I'm concerned about habitat conservation, and I'd like to know what what the board or what the water district has been doing, particularly about sand hills conservation and control of, of the brooms. Um, I'm concerned about the endangered species there. Uh, we're now near the end of the growing season for brooms, which is a uh, non-native invasive pest shrub and um, it severely threatens the sand hills habitat. We all, we all know that. But I'm concerned that the, that the board cut the water district's environmental program by 50% recently and that doesn't sound very good for uh, proceeding with control of the broom and protection of the endangered species habitat. So I'd like to know what the updated plans are for uh, both integrated pest management and also habitat maintenance um, of the sand hills habitat that, that we have. I <coughs> learned that uh, the district has now lost their other environmental employee. Um, and so um, I'm really alarmed about that. That sounds like, you know, we're in some pretty bad shape. So uh, I'd like to know why that happened and what is going to be done to fill back in the environmental staff. Thank you. Unfortunately, we can't answer all those questions. Okay. Um, Virgil, you had your hand up there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Virgil Campbell Brookdale. Um, I think we need a strategy um, to better, you know, manage the, our Santa Margarita groundwater agency involvement. Um, I've been a, you know, and I'd like to suggest that, that we have an agenda item on the next meeting that, to discuss this. Um, because um, we've got to have some kind of a coordination because I think we're being marginalized there. And I've been attending them for um, most of a year now. And, um, there's, there's still no clarity about their, their motivations, their goals, and the intended impact on the uh, aquifer. Um, and we depend on half, you know, half of our water comes from that aquifer. So, um, anyway, uh, and I'm also confused by the origins of the agency. Um, because um, we were originally considered ignorable by the state. And, um, and, you know, with respect to the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Act. And then apparently somebody on our end thought that uh, SIGWA was a, a good idea and petitioned the state for inclusion. 
this is just a rumor. I don't know this for sure, but we do need to know this. And we need to understand what that motivation is, and, and, and that might help you know, inform our participation in it. It's a very expensive endeavor. We need to make sure that it's in our best interest, and I see no coordinated effort to do that. Thank you. Um, yes, I can clarify why. I, uh, I don't think that's appropriate now. I, I think I can we need to have an I agenda item the board? for this. Okay, and give information to the board as to why the initial. You, you have uh, five minutes to okay, uh, speak. Five minutes. Um, on that, on the issue of the Santa Margarita, I think it is a very important issue, and I think uh, it will be going, uh, will be in the future. Um, the reason for that was that the initial groundwater basins, as defined, uh, were defined based upon the alluvial outcrops, which are tight, small and tiny pieces okay, of the district. Um, it looked from the perspective of the Department of Water Resources that there wasn't much going on there. So the Department of Water Resources did not understand the basin, the basin, bound, the basin designations were inaccurate, they were wildly inaccurate. So when the reality of what those uh, basins looked like um, came to be known, that was communicated to DWR, and it is realistic that the basin be a medium priority, not a critical one, um, but it's a medium priority basin properly, and uh, there's nothing unusual going on for that change in designation. Thank you. Uh, anybody else uh, in public comment out there? Yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Dave from mm -hmm. Felton. And I just was uh, looking online at the uh, applications or the statements from the potential new board members, and I was really impressed that we had somebody applying for a job that's a 40-year geology professor from Stanford who has su substantial knowledge of groundwater issues who's willing to... You know what, be, you're going to get to talk about that uh, when we take that uh, item up, uh -huh. and you can... Say all the good things you want about it. Oh, okay. Them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Any item that's not on the agenda? Okay. Yeah. All right. So we will, and, and we're going to get to what you want to talk about right now. Uh, unfinished business, um, the vacancy in uh, the elective office. Of the board of directors, do you want to? Uh, we have uh, District Council Nichols that uh, will take this on. Sure. Okay. So um, I provided the prior briefing on the process um, by which the board uh, chose to appoint a new board member to fill the vacancy rather than uh, going down the route of having a special election call. Um, so the, uh, the district did post the notice that was required for at least 15 days to solicit applicants. You have um, four applications, I believe, in your board packet. Um, the uh, board president uh, has a good deal of discretion how to shape this process, but a recommendation is to do it as we have in the past for this type of process, which is to allow the applicants to introduce themselves, pose any prepared questions you may have to each of the applicants, conduct uh, public oral communications where the public can speak to express their views about the applicants, and then board discussion, um, where if, it, if, you, if you would like, uh, Chairperson Henry, the suggestion would be to have each board member provide comments before entertaining motions not to appoint any of the applicants. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to kind of do this like we did it the last time we went through this, and um, call on the applicants alphabetically uh, by last name, and um, I will ask them to introduce themselves. I have some questions. I'll run by the questions. The board hasn't heard them, so if board member wants to uh, add something to the questions. I have six questions here. Um, first one is, why do you want to be on the board and what skills do you bring to the board? Two, uh, do you understand the dynamics of being a board member? 
Three, what is your commitment to civil discourse? Four, being on the board is a big commit time commitment, and hopefully you need to understand that. Number five is, can you deal with criticism and listen? Six, are you familiar with the mission of Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? So, and do you have anything you want to add? Lou? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, that being the case, I will call on Brant first. Is he there? Um, Brant's on his way here from work. He had to work in the Bay Area today, so he'll be here any moment. Um, okay. Um, if you could call him last, that would be appreciated. Is that an issue? No. Okay. Uh, so, Gail. Yeah, you wanna. Sure. You'd be next. Oh, I'm scale too. So, <laughs> it, 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 I it, it, yeah. So you wanna? I guess we could hear you from back there. Yeah. Probably it might be tough to get out. So um, if you could just introduce yourself, give us a little information about yourself. Some of these questions, they're probably in in your what you gave to the board to see, but not everybody gets to see them. So some of my questions, you will be repeating yourself probably. So <coughs> just introduce yourself and give us the highlights. Okay. Um, I'm Gail Mayhood, and I moved to Felton a couple of years ago and um, rapidly learned about the paradox of living in the Santa Cruz Mountains where there's an awful lot of water, but not enough storage of it. And I started attending um, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin meetings and became very interested in um, the problems of understanding the aquifer. These are rock units that I've known about because I've led field trips at Stanford for 40 years to the coast, showing undergraduate students these same uh, Santa Margarita and Monterey <coughs> Formation and the Purissima and the granites that are uh, the basement of us. Um, and so I recently retired after 40 years and I'd like to contribute to the community and I thought maybe a good way to do that would be to um, partly uh, be encouraged by my neighbors, including Elaine here, um, that I might want to get involved with the board. So when this opening came open I thought that perhaps my skills uh, in geology would be complementary to the skills of the other board members. Okay, so Number one question was, why do you want to be on the board, and what skills do you learn? Okay. I, I think I sort of answered, yeah. I answered that already. Let me just clarify, I am not a hydrologist. My specialty actually is volcanology. Um, but uh, because I've taught um, courses to general audiences and um, have led field trips all over the western U.S., I'm familiar with hydrology geohydrology and the sort of uh, vocabulary that gets used in that. And I'm also familiar with the sorts of modeling and simulations that are done um, for uh, groundwater uh, models, for example, that we have to produce for the groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, so my second question was, do you understand the dynamics of being on board? Uh, what do you mean, the dynamics? Uh, well, I mean, what... It, as a board member, what are your responsibilities? Um, well, as I kind of, you know, how does a board work? Let's well, say. my understanding is there's two meetings a month of the board of directors, um, and there's obviously from the agenda that we were sent, there's considerable homework that goes along with this <laughs> if you're going to do a good job, right? Reading all of these things, um, and then serving as a member on some of the other committees. So for example, in my case, I think maybe the engineering uh, committee or the environmental one. And then of course, I would like to be involved as a uh, liaison with the um, Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin. <coughs> and I guess I would also anticipate um, probably going to the meetings of the, um, the Central Coast Groundwater, um, the Mid-County Groundwater, because they're way ahead of us. I mean, they've. I, I haven't read, I've scanned the 400 page behemoth uh, that we have that is their proposed um, groundwater sustainability plan. And so we're kind of lucky in the sense that they, they've, they've got different groundwater issues, but at least we have a template for that. So I think 
following what they're doing would be helpful. So as far as the way um, boards like this run is, um, I, I know that um, you deal with issues that are um, contentious and it's important that people be civil when they speak to each other. I've been a department chair at Stanford. I've been a vice provost. I've been, uh, I chaired the, the Stanford Faculty Senate. I know how to be involved in meetings um, <laughs> and keep things civil, and um, so I know what that requires. I think you just answered question number three. I think I did. <laughs> Your commitment to civil discourse, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you realize being on the board can be a big time commitment. Yeah, I think I described what I anticipate that there would be. And then there's, you know, presumably also, I think one of the things that I see as a challenge for the board is once we get going on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Sustainability Plan, that, that's going to have to be communicated to the public and, um, I want to say sold, but get buy-in um, from the public and so people understand it. And so I. You know, I, I can see that's not going to happen the next year, but going forward, either one way or another, I would like to be involved in helping do that. Okay. Um, how do you deal with criticism? Because obviously we get quite a bit. Uh, that, well, let's say you don't, you're not a professor at Stanford. And, um, you get used to getting criticism, especially when you've uh, been chair of the faculty senate. And for example, I was uh, students. Suggesting I be taken out and hung because I suggested maybe we should bring back Van Gray to Stanford. So, or writing, you know, grant proposals where people say very nasty things to you. So I, I, I've had plenty of uh, plenty of experience being criticized, um, and uh, I, I think I I can handle it. Okay, good. Uh, so my sixth question you you know about. Santa Margarita, you've been to the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency meetings. Any other thing you want to say? Um, just that to echo what you're saying, this is really important, right? And it's going to, um, you know, not this year, but in the next couple of years, it's going to be increasingly a big job of this board to develop that. And it's also going to control what we have to do in terms of thinking about um, reserving for capital improvements in the future that may be required in part by coming into compliance with things that have to do with the groundwater basin and also things that involve in, uh, in the new and transfer of waters to um, various parts of the groundwater basin. So this is beyond the things that we're doing now, which is fixing leaky pipes. Okay. It's a big issue. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, Rick Moran. Hi, I'm Rick Moran from Ben Lowe. Um, thank you for considering my application. I grew up near a pond and I saw the near extinction of the osprey, uh, sea hawk or fish hawk. Nearby farmers had been using DDT and DDT had the unintended consequence of causing thin undeveloped eggshells. The osprey was in danger of extinction. The people responded. DDT was banned. The osprey survived, and now the osprey is thriving. That was an important lesson to me. Now, our water district has a slogan of pipes, pumps, and tanks. Well, I have an intimate knowledge of pipes, pumps, and tanks. I lived on a submarine a big day, for four years. Our lives depended on the smooth operation of those pipes, pumps, and tanks. Our water district also is required, is uh, heavily you know, reliant on those pieces of machinery. It will always be a top priority of mine that pipes, pumps, and tanks are taken care of. Now, some of you may know me from the Environmental Committee, where I served two terms, and I brought up and created awareness about the dangers of Roundup and glyphosate. The people of this valley heard that, they responded, they voted for three new members of the board that promised not to use glyphosate. It was one of the first things this board did, was ban glyphosate. Thank you for that. But we're not done. <coughs> we need to create an integrated pest management plan that deals with pest issues throughout the district. So. Yes. 
If I ask you the first question, why do you want to be on the board and what skills you bring, are, are these, is that something you're going to yes. talk about? Yes, I will. Okay. okay. Can I yeah, continue? go ahead. Yes. So you know me from the Environmental Committee. Um, as a teacher, I taught at Quail Hollow School and SLB Elementary. I taught the Life Lab program, it was a science-based, hands-on outdoor program. At White Oak High School, I taught environmental science, and my classes built a garden, raised a garden, ate from that garden. But they also became focused observers of their environment. They looked at the sand hills, the redwood forests, the creeks, and our San Lorenzo <coughs> River. They became environmentally literate in my class about their valley and their future uh, in this valley. At home, I'm a gardener. And my wife and I, through drought and flood, have maintained that garden. And we're often give garden tours. Most recently, we gave a garden tour to the Valley Churches United. Over 600 people visited our garden. They saw in our garden was organic food crops. They saw a drought tolerant iris field. They saw a cactus and succulent garden that thrives in drought. But mostly what they saw was that the appreciation and what we all share is the appreciation for this beautiful place. We've won awards, our garden has won awards from the Monterey Bay Master Gardeners Program for water conservation. And my goal would be to have a um, water system that we can pass on to our next generation that they could live in this beautiful place. So I'll, I'll answer your questions. That was uh, okay. a statement that I wanted okay. to make. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Um, so why do you want to be on the board and what skills do you bring? Well, I've been coming to board meetings and I've been involved in uh, various committees and various board uh, and district activities for a few years now. And uh, a few things that I'm interested in, in dealing with is the infrastructure. There is uh, old infrastructure that needs to be updated, there's broken pipes that need to be replaced, there's leaky tanks that need to be replaced as well. I want, that's the top priority of mine. Also, water rates. We have a population that many people are on a tight budget, and we need to be fiscally responsible. Third, we need an integrated pest management policy. We need to be environmentally sound caretakers of our watershed. And that means we need to have a, a district-wide guidelines about dealing with pest issues, not just the sand hills. And fourth is we need to get this grand jury investigation behind us. We need to follow their recommendations and get this behind us. But mostly in those years that I've been coming, I've seen three board members resign. And part of our political tradition is that when that we all ordinary citizens participate. Well, I'm an ordinary citizen. I want to participate. This is me stepping up to that obligation. Okay. Uh, do you understand the dynamics of being on a water board? Yes, I do. I've come to many meetings. I've met with all of you privately or in public, and I've been on the committees, and I have a realistic expectation of what this job requires, and I'm willing and able to fulfill that. And I already know the answer to this. What is your commitment to civil discourse? Well, I've been on the losing end of some civil discourse, so I'm a, <laughs> uh, a proponent of being civil. And uh, if I have the opportunity to be on this board, I will be a respectful listener who works to find common ground. And you realize this is a big time commitment. Yes, I do, Lois. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've experienced it. I've been on these committees. I've come to meetings. Okay. Okay. I've, I've been involved. So um, can you deal with criticism and listen? Uh, I've been criticized my whole life. I grew up with a family of four, 
and uh, I've been married for 43 years. I've gotten some criticism. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> We've worked it all out. <laughs> you go, Chris. <laughs> okay. He can take it. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you familiar with the mi mission of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? I am familiar with the purpose and the state mandate of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. I support their, um, the idea for regional cooperation. But make no doubt, I would never give up local control of our watershed. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Amber Steele. Ander Steele, is he here? So, okay. <laughs> no, I do not want to read this. Is Brant here? I am, ma'am, right here. Oh. <laughs> Let, late to the party. Thank you, guys. Junior, Lois, Junior. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> say Junior. Oh, <laughs> well, Brant L. Haddon Junior, at your service, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Oh, no wonder you were confused. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, yes, I'm. I'm confused. Fair enough. <laughs> You're you know not the that. first. You won't be the last. <laughs> I, I got blonde roots, so I can't help it. All right. Uh, so. Um, did you hear kind of some of the questions and I've, is that you're to step up and sure and I've heard I've heard as, as long as I've been in here I heard the last interview okay and to introduce yourself just give a little brief history of yourself it'd be my pleasure uh, ladies and gentlemen of the community and members of the board my name is Brent Elhaden jr. I'm from Long Pico I uh, alumni of San Jose State University I uh, run a uh, small security firm. Uh, it's based in between Campbell and South San Jose. And I service clients all throughout the uh, peninsula, all the way down to, uh, here into the valley. Uh, so I probably have 17 major contracts. Largest one is a Seize Candy Corporation, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I was actually uh, on a conference call with them, so I apologize for my tardiness. But um, I am more than uh, at your service at this moment for any questions that you guys have. I have six questions, actually. Please do, no. Okay. Why do you want to be on the board, and what skills do you bring? Well, that's a uh, fantastic question. First and foremost, um, my whole thing is uh, I'm a businessman, and uh, I've uh, been lauded for my skills in what's called <coughs> quantitative analysis, especially as it results to uh, interpreting big data statistics, um, hence my success at a young age. Um, this seems like quite the, the problem with a lot of dynamic variable issues. And those are the things that uh, I really strive to, to analyze and find solutions for. Now, uh, oftentimes in a, something as complicated as this, I would be uh, n not totally honest if I said that uh, I had full understanding of all the concepts. But I think that in that system is really what lies the, uh, the kind of master of my facilitation skills and our ability to kind of take a step back and have a larger look at the overall problem and then find a common ground solution that works with all of the um, interchangeable variables in such a dynamic environment as the water district. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, question two. Do you understand the dynamics of being on, of being a board member, being on a board? Certainly, and that's a fair question for someone my age. Um, I've been the vice president of San Jose State Hockey for several years, which is one of the largest hockey clubs in the collegiate level in the ACHA on the West Coast. And I started doing that awfully young. Um, I was also involved in student politics as a, uh, as a young kid growing up, which was uh, always a little bit uh, too much fun. But uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, as much as any uh, young man could without actually being a member of this board, I do understand the dynamic relationship of, of such a, a diverse group. Right. And my whole commitment is to uh, take a thorough understanding of that and do a comprehensive analysis and then work with yourself and the rest of the members of the board and the community to find uh, reasonable solutions. Good answer. Um, 
what is your commitment to civil discourse? Well, I'm a big fan of history, ma'am. And uh, I believe it was uh, JFK who made a commentary on the importance of civil discourse. And there's something to the effect of, from debate comes understanding. And in these type of uh, issues, oftentimes I think that the, the biggest problem is having a difficult time understanding the scope of the problem. Because oftentimes when you can do a good job of creating that sort of awareness, um, it's a little bit easier to facilitate a solution. Um, being on the board is a big time commitment. Sounds like you've got a pretty busy job. And... There's well, committees, there's board meetings, there's various and sundry things. There's the packets to read. And so do you have that kind of time? Uh, that, that's a fair question. Uh, I, I do have the time, ma'am, and I also have the youthful vigor to do my due diligence in that regard as well, which I think uh, is probably something we're going to need. It doesn't really make, take youthful vigor. <laughs> Well, you certainly have enough of a man. <laughs> oh, boy. He is good, isn't he? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, can you deal with criticism and listen? Uh, I think that listening is the key word in dealing with criticism there. Um, it's important to, to feel criticism, especially because, you know... We all have the curse of a limited perspective, right? So the more, the more details that we can take in and the more feedback that we can get, especially from you know, colleagues, peers, members of the community, mentors, it always is the, the better benefit for uh, not just myself, but for the community in such a role like this. Last question. Are you familiar with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? <laughs> I am familiar with the fact that it is a massive undertaking going underway here. Um, I, I've been doing my due diligence in the, in the research on the, all the variables associated with that. And so I guess the best way to answer that question is to say I'm not going to stop uh, learning about the Santa Margarita uh, situation as it continues to develop. Um, and it seems like at this point that seems to be pretty much the, the consensus is it's a, it's a large uh, issue and it definitely impacts efficiency and sustainability and future plans going forward in terms of finding efficient solutions to growth and not just that but creating community awareness. But uh, I guess the answer to that one is as much as anyone could at this point. Okay, that's true. Well, I thank you for coming in and answering the questions. My pleasure. Thank you. So, did Andrew Steele ever show up? No? Okay. All right. Um, so, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to the public. You can make comments uh, about who impressed you, why they impressed you, whatever. Just um, be nice. <laughs> okay, I see a hand way back there. Oh, okay. Okay, Elaine. Okay. Oh, uh, how many people are going to want to con uh, con comment? Oh, I guess. Five minutes is okay. Okay, Elaine. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Elaine Fresco. I live in Felton, and um, I serve as a volunteer on the Environmental Committee. And I'm here to um, support Gail's application for the board. Um, she is a neighbor, a friend, and we uh, both belong to the same book group. So, I have, I know about her educational and her professional qualifications, which can't be more impressive, but I also know her in a group setting. And um, we have a diverse book group, and we talk about our books, but we also get off topic, and sometimes it gets fairly heated, and Gail is the calm and reasoned and diplomatic voice in the group. Everyone admires her and likes her and respects her, and um, <clears throat> she's a very good listener, and she's a very good teacher. She has a great way of explaining concepts, 
And so I just think she would be an incredible asset. Uh, as uh, serving on the environmental committee, I have gotten those packets of information, and they are hard to read through, a a especially if you don't have the background. I've been had to Google all these definitions to figure out what they were talking about. So I think in that way also she just would be uh, a, a, a wonderful addition to the board. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. That's my turn. Okay, it's your turn now. Hi, okay, I'm loaded for bear. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Dave McClellan from Felton, and I read most of the people's um, uh, statements online, and I was most notably really struck by the chance of us to have a geologist with 40 years' experience on the board of this uh, water company. And also with somebody uh, like Brent who seems to have a really good grasp of business uh, workings. And uh, I just wanted to say it seems like a really great opportunity. These people have showed up now and have some really good skills. And that's what I have to say. Okay. Anybody else? Virgil? Uh, hi, Virgil Champlin, Brookdale. You know, this is the best candidate or best applicant um, cadre that I have ever seen in the several years that I've been watching this. And there's like, it's kind of like you people get to pick the best of the best rather than the least worst. And that's where you're at. And, um, and so I, I kind of really hate to take sides here, but I happen to have witnessed um, the experience of Rick Moran. And so if all things are equal, the thing that isn't equal is the open history and exposure that Rick Moran has had over the last few years. And so the quality of the candidates is no longer an issue. They just took that away from you. Um, and um, he, he's an, he has integrity, he has civility, he was pilloried by, the, uh, by a previous board and took it with the stride of withdrawal rather than engagement. It was, it was, he, he would have to have been incivil to do that. And, she, you know, that director that was responsible for this is no longer here, fortunately. And I see the existing directors as being a font of um, uh, engagement. And I don't know whether these applicants are a result of enge that engagement or serendipity, but it doesn't matter. They're both really good reasons. And um, he's also the only one that has mentioned affordability. Outside, the only person that's mentioned affordability that is a potential candidate, and except for the California State Water Code, it insists on affordability, yet nobody raises that. Section 106.3, paragraph A. And, um, and I've got to support that, because there are a lot of people that aren't here now that affordability is a crucial thing in their life. And I've said enough. <laughs> okay. Any other Well, I might be a little biased because I'm Brent Haddon's stepmother, but um, having had him in my household for, for 29 years now, I can say he's a fine young man. He worked, played soccer, or not soccer, hockey, put himself through San Jose State. I think he knows how to manage his time. He's smart, he's sharp, and he, like he said, is full of youthful vigor. <laughs> So I hope you consider him. <laughs> Thank you. Any other? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, my name is Alexis Crosstew. I'm from Felton. And I was looking at the applications online, and I think Gail is extremely qualified. So I really urge you to appoint her. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Annie. OK, Bill? Yes, um, I really want to support Rick Moran because he has so much experience with the district already and the general area. He's attended board leader meetings, been on the environmental committee, and uh, spends a great deal of time uh, 
concerned about the environment and about the water district in general uh, improving in the future with this current new board that has uh, actually changed things considerably since the last uh, election. And I think that he would contribute a lot. It wouldn't take him any time <laughs> to get um, up to speed because he's already very knowledgeable about the comings and goings of the district, past, uh, past price problems and, and solutions that have been proposed. Thank you. Anybody else like to Debbie? Yeah. Deborah Lowen. And um, I'm also in support of Rick Fran. Um, I've worked with Rick a lot on different projects in, in the district, and I'm uh, quite aware of his passion for environmental stewardship, which I think is the, sort of the missing key in this board. Um, what he brings in addition to all the other qualified candidates is his depth of service and interest and his public outreach is outstanding. He has a real passion for getting people to understand what the issues are and of, of reacting to what people want. And I think that's what this board needs, is someone who's really on top of where this district stands, where, what we're motivated by, <coughs> what direction we're going in right now. And he has the whole history with him. And I agree with Bill. He's going to hit the ground running and be a real asset. And so I support all the boards election of him for this position. Thank you. Yes, I, um, I'm Virginia Wright and I applied last time there was an opening. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember yeah. you. I liked you last night. <laughs> <laughs> if I would have gone for a woman, it probably would have been. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, maybe you can have the opportunity to go for a woman this time. I, re I, read, I went online and I read the applications and I just want to, I'm trying to become more familiar with the water board and following things more than I have in the past. And I really think that Gail um, would bring a lot because she is new. And I think, and because she brings a level of, um, it looks to me, because I, I don't know personally, but it looks to me she would bring the level of professional interaction because I know what it's like. Well, both my parents were academics, and I know that that situation of being in those those meetings with very, it can be very contentious to be in those things and she served on boards and committees and I think bringing that sort of level of expertise and new eye is actually something that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, um, yes. Hi, my name is Martha Garrity and I'm Brant's mom. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's my bias, his biological mother. And I just want to talk a little bit about my son's strengths. Um, he has a creative solutions approach to problem solving, um, thinks outside the box. He grew up with a philosophy, I don't know if you guys ever read Rich Dad Poor Dad, but he basically teaches that instead of saying, this can't be done, he says, how can we get it done? And that I think is huge because it opens up the possibilities uh, to allow things to come in of uh, learning. Um, we don't know what we don't know. He also offers diversity to the board, um, which I think is very important. Um, and uh, the other thing that he has is he's a very caring person, and taking care of people has always been one of his priorities. Um, many, many years ago, um, he actually uh, went above and beyond to make sure that all of his cousins got Christmas presents, and he was the one who provided them that year. Um, which is above and beyond for a young man to do. We have a massive family, don't we? <laughs> in this day and age, you know. So I just want to say that I think um, his assets and his qualities and his caring about the community and about people. Um, he also puts in lots of extra time in uh, taking care of the property and developing, uh, you know, making sure that it's safe and that it's accessible and uh, all of the water damage after the large uh, uh, floods that were done, he spent a massive amount of time uh, working on the property with that and bringing in uh, some of his peers from San Jose State who have different businesses and different skills and abilities to help with that. So I'd like to have you uh, seriously consider him. Thank you. He's a, you have a fabulous young son. <laughs> Thank you. Um, back. Uh, Barbara. Thanks. I, I was trying to see who had their paw up that uh, I, I wanted to support Rick Moran. Uh, I think I've known Rick for a couple of years, and I've seen his passion on, about the environmental issues. 
uh, most specifically the banning of glyphosate. Uh, he brought forward a lot of the scientific data on the health issues associated with this poison, and he's had a passion for the environment and served two terms on the SLBWD Environmental Committee. He attends most of the board meetings. I know that he follows a lot of literature. He subscribes to a lot of environmental literature, and he's well aware of everything that the board is doing uh, every single month. I did also want to say that I was very impressed with Gail's uh, resume, um, and I think that, that someday you might make a great director, but I think you probably need to have a little more visibility and be on a committee and, you know, just uh, contribute. Uh, but, I, but I was extremely impressed with your resume. Thank you. Okay, and right, uh, right behind you, sir. Green. You. Yes. <laughs> uh, Barbara Hanson Felton. Uh, I too am very impressed with Gail's resume, and I feel it's really important <coughs> on a board to have someone who's extremely good at managing expectations and system systems uh, that she has the. Uh, wherewithal to do some of that education that we're going to need in the future, that Santa Margarita is critical to our health of our community, and I really want to see that succeed, and I know it's going to take public uh, attention. Uh, I have a neighbor right now who has grass and waters his lawn every damn day. You know, our people need to understand we live in a drought-stricken area, and education should be attended to. Thank you. So, Peter Gelblum, I live in Boulder Creek. Um, Grant sounds like a wonderful guy, but I, I think that the choice really is, has to be between Rick and Gail in terms of experience. And um, for me, it comes down to this, that Gail, a couple of things. One, I think it would be great to have another woman on the board who's severely imbalanced right now. Um, but more importantly, uh, she has this extraordinary depth of learning. It's not just a resume, but she knows more than probably anybody in this room does about the geology of this area and about geology in general, including Rick, probably. Um, uh, Rick has a few more years' experience with the board. I think he said he's been following him for three years, the last three years. Um, uh, first started in the committee, first started in the environment committee in 2016. So, uh, and Gail, I think, has been following her for two years now since she got here, so one more year um, for Rick. But uh, it seems to me that it would be a great deal easier for Gail to learn about what she doesn't already know about the district's inner workings than it would be for Rick to learn what Gail has learned in 40 years of teaching science. Um, it's too late for any of us to learn <laughs> everything she's learned. Uh, so, so to weighing those two things, it seems to me that Gail um, is the better choice. Anybody else out there? Uh, oh, yes, Larry. I saw your finger. Okay. Yeah, Larry. Huh? Was there somebody behind me? No, no. I don't think so. Uh, Larry Ford Felton. Um, Wow, this is really a difficult choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, each one of the three candidates who just presented themselves offers an awful lot. I, I, as you know, I'm really concerned about fire management and habitat conservation. I think we're in an extraordinary moment where we need really significant technical and innovation skills. I think those are the two most important skills that you want to judge these candidates on. The technical skills that they bring and the innovation. I was particularly impressed by Grant talking about his uh, expertise with comprehensive analysis of big data. You might not be aware of what that is, but this is what's about to descend on us from Silicon Valley. Not only are they taking, you know, keeping track of all of our habits online and phone calls and things like that, but it's also a lot of data that can be analyzed quickly <clears throat> in order to make decisions that normal people couldn't do. So I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for you to pick somebody like Grant to, to be able to add that dimension. We talked uh, in, on, in previous board meetings about this dilemma of, you know, we have to cut costs, so we have to contain costs. Well, the way to maintain an environmental program and other things 
while still cutting costs is through innovation. So let's see some innovation. Let's bring that more to the forefront in here. And then the other thing is, <clears throat> it'd be crazy not to uh, pick Gail, professor, emeritus professor, former chair of the faculty senate at Stanford. Oh my god. And uh, <clears throat> so all the skills that come with that about working with people, understanding <clears throat> about how education comes together with technical knowledge, I think. <clears throat> Either of those two would be really outstanding additions to this board. I'm a technical person. I also, you know, appreciate other things. But um, I, I think we're in a, a time of urgency to solve some really important problems. One of them is, is the geology of these mountains, and the other one is uh, innovation to solve problems while cutting costs. Anybody else out there that I can't see? I, I guess um, that, that does it. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate our candidates. They're fabulous, all three of them. Um, I am going to go to the board now and let them make some choices. I'm going to go to you first, Bob. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I have to echo what Larry was saying about, and others saying this is a fabulous group from which to choose. Um, one of the things that I do think our board has a responsibility to do is to um, work and encourage um, the next generation of leadership that's going to be stepping into the board. That, that transition is going to happen faster than all of us sitting up here want. Uh, one way or the other, and um, we need to be working on that. And I think uh, the kind of skill set that you have um, lends itself well to a board seat. Uh, at some point in the future, I would encourage you in the short term to become involved in one of our committees. And um, uh, the committee openings will happen in December, and we do also have an opening in the engineering committee right now. Um, I think this would be a great way for you to learn a lot more about the district and to invest some time in um, understanding the issues that, that we face. Um, and I would recommend the, the same thing to Professor Mahout, um, because your background, of course, is outstanding. Um, and I think there's a lot that you could help us with uh, through that committee process. Um, myself, I, I mean, I, I, I support Rick because I was actually at the meeting where that uncivil act took place, and I'd never met Rick before. I didn't know who he was, but after I saw him articulate his position so well in public and to stand his ground when faced with and do it in a way that was very civil, even when faced with a barrage. I said, that guy I want to be in a foxhole with when push comes to show. Um, because he has the understanding of the environment in a way that just really impressed me. Um, that's two years ago now, Rick, I think. Maybe two and a half, something, three. It's been a while. It was, and. Um, I think, Rick, you make an outstanding board member. You will hit the ground running if you're selected. Um, you have my support. Uh, Steve, are you still with us? Yeah, absolutely, Lois. Uh, do you want to voice an opinion? I'd be happy to. I was, uh, when, I, when, I, when I first heard that there was going to be another vacancy on the board, the first and only name that came to my mind was uh, Rick Moran. And, uh, and I'm so happy that he applied for the uh, for the open position. Having having read the uh, applications and some of the resumes of the other uh, applicants, uh, as Bob says, I couldn't encourage them enough to take the opportunity to participate in some of the committees that are open and uh, will be open in the future. And, uh, and that's a, a great way of getting some of the nuts and bolts experience of what the board and uh, the, the water district is like 
and as well as giving an opportunity to become more familiar with the staff, etc., in the board. But uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm just uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to support Rick uh, in his efforts to uh, to become a director. So uh, again, I thank all the candidates for their participation, and again, I encourage them all to get involved with the committees to start with and. Uh, and get ready for the next uh, vacancy, because there will be another one sooner or later. Thank you, Lois. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to echo what so many people have said, which is that we're lucky to have a strong, qualified group of applicants tonight, and I'd like to thank everyone for, for applying for the position on the board. I'd like to address all the applicants at this point and, and say continue to engage, uh, strive to serve because if you don't get on, keep trying and you will. I think it was my fourth attempt at trying to serve the board or serve the district before I was seated on the board. So it, sometimes perseverance is, is the, the, right, the right attitude along with the, the right skills. As far as who to pick, I think about the, I think about the skill set that's important to be a board member. And as I analyze the different skills that are required, or that I think that are required, the one that really jumps out at me is being familiar with this district and our unique problems. I think it's important for a person to be able to hit the ground running, because that's what they'll need to do. We, we have a very ambitious um, schedule of things we want to accomplish. Uh, next year there's going to be an election, so there's going to be some distractions from what we need to do, so we really need to have the people on board that can get things done quickly. And familiarity is something you just cannot replace. I mean, you either have it or you don't. So for that reason, I believe the best candidate uh, for the board is Rick Moran. So I support him for board member. And again, I please encourage the others to continue to apply. Your turn will come. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like I'm going to get a woman. Uh, Grant, you're great. I, I would love you to be on the board, and it would be great if you would uh, actually apply to be on the committee. Um, I think you have a lot to offer. You're a smart young man. And don't call me ma'am, though. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, Gail, I'm so impressed with you. I talked to you at the Santa Margarita meeting. Um, I thought you'd be fabulous also. Uh, and hey, another woman. Not that it matters whether it's a woman or a man, it shouldn't. It's mostly the men who say they want another woman. I don't know why, they've had me. And I'm a pain. So, uh, I saw you shake your head there. <laughs> Not you, yeah. Anyway. I, it, it sounds like the decision is made. It takes three votes, and we've got three um, recommendations for Rick Moran. So, somebody want to make a, a, a motion? All right. I'll, I move that we appoint. Rick Moran as a director of the Central Valley Water District to serve through the yes, 2020, the, um, 2020 election. To serve through the 2020 election. <coughs> I will second that motion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Holly, can you call the question? Director Ferris? Aye. Okay. Director Falls? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Swan? Yes. Okay. So um, maybe we could take a little break here, and then we'll have uh, the oath of office given. Would it be okay if we took a five-minute break here?
It's up to me. Need the praise. <laughs> Let's take a little five minute break. Okay, recording has started. You're going to give Rick the both of this? Now you may stand if you would please. <laughs> and uh, raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Rick Moran. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution. Of the state of California. And I take this obligation freely. And I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well. That I will well. And faithfully discharge. And faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next item is the uh, San Lorenzo Water District Revenue Certificate. I guess I can start out and Stephanie can jump in at any time. Um, to read the memo. I recommend that the board review the memo. And adopt a, we have a resolution dedicating the fourteen million five hundred thousand in proceeds of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Revenue uh, Certificate Participation uh, Series 2019, issued under the trust agreement um, by and among uh, Zion's Bank Corporation National Association, dated as August 1st, 2019 for the completion of capital improvement projects. And we have an exhibit A in the agenda, and we also have the nine projects marked uh, on the, the map on the wall. You'll see uh, green push pins. Uh, and each project is located up on that map. Um, uh, the district uh, pursued certificates of participation to fund upcoming capital improvement projects. The capital market interest rates became more favorable in the previous plan, the USDA loan that the district uh, filed an application for and was moving forward on. A certificate of participation is a tax-exempt financing agreement that is solid to investors and securities uh, resembling bonds. There is then a, a trustee assigned that will take the semi-annual payments from the district and distribute to the uh, investors accordingly. The loan, term, uh, are long ter the loan terms are $14,025,000 for 30 years at a true interest cost of 2.99% with a prepayment option with no penalty after uh, September 1st, 2029. Uh, in your agenda packet, you have a, a list of projects. The projects were selected from the district's 2015 capital improvements project list. The projects were selected based on uh, risk of failure, age of the, uh, the existing facility, uh, uh, improved fire safety, fire flow, community safety, a cost savings improvements to operations that uh, we respond to you know, leak repair and, and different operational problems from uh, the projects. The amount of population served by individual projects. Water quality uh, uh, reliability and uh, some of these projects are reimbursed funding uh, La Pico projects from uh, the La Pico Assessment District. The two largest projects are Lion and Quail Hollow Pipelines which will impact 100% of the district customers by the ability to move large amounts of water from one end of the distribution system to the other. Uh, these mainline replacements uh, and upgrades will correct many low water pressure areas, removing restrictions, and greatly improve, improve water flow to Boulder Creek, Ben Loman, Long Pico, Ziani, and the probation zones. Uh, the project will be completed hopefully over a three-year period. Uh, and uh, we have a, a resolution that requires board director's approval uh, for any changes to the project list. We thought it would be important that the board um, 
approve these projects and that if there was a change that staff would just not do it, we would come back to the board and discuss why there would be a change. Um, the descriptions of the projects are in your packet. They're, they're a little bit lengthy, but I'll give you, um, but, you know, basically it's the Lion Zone. It's 5,600 lineal feet of 12-inch water line. We have a Sequoia Avenue uh, water main replacement, which is 800 feet of 8-inch water line. We have a hillside water main replacement, which is 1,900 feet, lineal feet of 6-inch main. We have the California Drive project, which is uh, 1,840 lineal feet of 6-inch water line. We have the good old swim tanks that we've been working on replacement for quite some time. Uh, the 62,000 uh, gallon bolted steel. Uh, the largest project, which will make the biggest impact to the distribution system um, for many different uh, reasons for uh, water supply, is the Quail Hollow Zone, which is 7,500 lineal feet of 12 inch. It's a major restriction of flow uh, right almost in the center of our distribution system. And then we have the Lumpico water storage tanks, the Caskey Lewis, and the drone tanks. Those are the list of projects. Uh, you have a uh, resolution. Uh, in your packet. Uh, the finance manager is here also to answer any questions in regards to the certificates for participation. And we'll open it up to, to questions to you all. Do you have any questions? Um, what's the payment? Six months? Is it? Every, yeah, semi, yeah, so every six Sorry, months. Sorry, what's the payment? What's the payment? Every six months, it's approximately seven hundred sixty thousand dollars. Isn't it on this list for, for the full year? Seven hundred sixty. Yeah. Payment. Yeah. I, uh, debt service. Yes. yes. I still plan to ask things to make sure they get mm -hmm. yep. into the. Yeah. So that'll be broken up into two payments in September and March. And um, is this money sufficient to do all of the, the Lompico projects? The Lompico tanks, so just the tanks. That's correct. Um, Steve, are you still with us? Yep, I'm here. Do you have any questions? No, I don't. Oh, Luke, how about you? I have no questions, but I have a statement I'd like to make. I would like to commend Rick Rogers in particular for shepherding this effort away from what was a uh, eight million dollar project under the USDA consideration where we were doing projects that we could get done quickly, not projects that were important to the future of this district, to one where, albeit it's going to cost a lot more money, we're now going to be, or we will be able to move large volumes of water from one end of the valley to the other, something we have not been able to do for a very long time. And that solves a lot of existing problems, I, I believe, that James deals with on a daily basis. So I just commend you for shepherding this through to where we went from projects that were easy to do, that were low on the priority list, to projects that were tough to do, and will put us in a, in a prime position to solve a lot of our infrastructure in the next three years. Good job. Well, thank you. <laughs> also, there's, you know, the Director of Finance, Stephanie, had a huge undertaking here when she removed the USDA loan, saved the district considerable funds, and went out and got this other funding mechanism, put a lot of work in moving this forward. Um, she really needs uh, to take the most of that. Thank you. Okay, new board member. Do you have anything you want to say? Uh, when I see this list, is it is it the list of the order that they're going to be done? Uh, no. Uh, um, the, which one are you going to dig on first? Uh, the uh, the uh, district engineer has bundled the projects. So uh, and I, I can't, I'll let him speak, but I do believe we'll go out to bid, uh, we'll bundle the funds to bundle, and then we'll meet with the contractor, and then they'll kind of select them. But the, hopefully, the most of these, though, all of these pipeline projects and the tanks will be completed over the next three years. Uh, we're looking for, and I don't want to speak for dinner, we're looking for a better price break by larger, by bundling together, by more, by, by more pipeline. And we found that the smaller projects weren't getting the interest from bidders. 
So I think uh, the engine district engineer will tell you that we've got considerable interest on these on these projects as we bundled it together. Uh, so Darren, you want to add to that? To speak? Yeah, sure. Uh, the three tanks, Caskey, Lewis, and the drone, yep. those are currently out to design. We mm -hmm. anticipate completing the design and the environmental process later this year and going out to uh, the construction of those tanks uh, early next spring. Uh, the top five pipelines, Lions Quay, Hillside, California, and Quail Hollow, will be opening an RFP for the design on uh, Friday, 3 o'clock. So once, you know, if the uh, RFPs come in acceptable, then we'll be bringing that back to the board to award the design contract. A swim tank, we're currently trying to acquire the site necessary to construct a swim tank. That's the first step. Uh, once we have a site that we're comfortable with, we'll move forward with the design of that tank. Thank you. And if maybe I can roll in uh, and we'll answer uh, Larry Ford's question about um, there is considerable environmental work that still needs to be done, and we will be moving a uh, replacement for the environmental position very quickly. So, so let you know that. are there questions from the public out there? Debbie? I, I also just have a comment. I'm really glad to see the Quail Hollow pipeline on this. Rick has explained the importance of it to the whole district. It is important to us in Lompico, but it has a much greater expansive need in the district, and I'm really happy to see that on it. it. has It was not on any previous list that I recall. And I also want to thank you for getting the Lompico tanks going and leveraging the assessment district funds. That's the smart way to do this instead of stretching it out and waiting for them to get more and more expensive, because you know the money's coming in, and so this is a great leverage moment, and I appreciate the district moving forward on that. Anybody else out there want to make a comment? So, um, we have a resolution here. Yes? I have one more comment I want to make, just to make sure we didn't pass it up. Um, Stephanie already also put together our debt service coverage number, which I think is important. This gives us an indication of how leveraged the district is with debt. And um, for the forecast out through 2024, uh, our low is 2.5 and our uh, high is 3.4, roughly. And our requirement for the debt, I believe, is 1.25. Is that correct? Requirement for debt covenant is 1.25. Best practices, you probably yeah, want to be around 2.5. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're definitely in that best practices area, and hopefully over time, we'll be able to generate sufficient funds to do more. And then with our, our new website, we'll have a project section and you will be able to see yes. updates and pictures. pictures and all of this will be transferred over to the new website. And we had a meeting today and, and uh, capital to a project to discuss and these projects will be front and center and hopefully you'll be able to follow the progress as we go along. So uh, who's going to read this resolution? Uh, President Hurd, it doesn't need to be read into the record. It just requires a motion to adopt oh, for resolution number six, nineteen. Yes. Okay. Well, I I'll move that we uh, make this resolution number six, nineteen twenty. Uh, I'll second that. I'm sorry. Who seconded? I. You did. So it doesn't have to be read in. It does not. Okay. Okay, you can do that. Thank you. Okay. Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Swan? Yes. Okay. Um, next item is. Uh, it is, it is, uh, about the uh, facilities update. Yeah, Rick, you want to? Sure. Um, this memo is recommending that the, the Board of Directors discuss possible action moving forward with a public advisory <laughs> or ad hoc committee for the sole purpose of evaluating the district's uh, administration and operations facilities needs. 
Uh, the district admin building is believed to have been constructed in the late 1800s. Um, in 1964, the district purchased the building and has been utilizing this building as our main headquarters for the district ever since. The district currently operates from four distinct facilities, the admin building, which is located in Boulder Creek, the operations building, which is this building here, the line treatment plant, which is in Boulder Creek, and then the Kirby treatment plant, which is in Felton. In addition, utilizes uh, other uh, buildings for uh, document storage in, in Felton and in Van Loman. Uh, the administrative building, which is the building across the street, currently houses the administration, customer service, accounting, environmental services, engineering, and small parts storage. Uh, currently, there are 11 employees utilizing this building. Uh, the structure is 100 plus years old and has been repeatedly adjusted to fit current needs. Uh, current issues, uh, not all inclusive, but uh, include the adequated, uh, antiquated electrical, mechanical, and plumbing issues, lack of seismic improvements, lack of ADA compliance to the point that where staff will go out to the street and meet people in their vehicle who can't come into the office because they can't get through the front door or in our, our limited lobby area. The lack of developed meeting and office space, you know, the foundation, more flooring, bathroom issues, uh, poor air quality, mold. Uh, two years ago, the district did install a modern HVAC system uh, which helped filter it out and uh, made a positive pressure in the building to keep the outside odors like from the old brewery and from the Mexican restaurant next door, <laughs> <laughs> which are problematic when you smell it all day long for day in, day out. Um, the operation building currently houses the field services, skater control, and a combined break room, board room, meeting room. Uh, currently, there are uh, 22 employees utilizing uh, this building, the majority of which arrive in the morning and the evening and uh, dispense uh, for field uh, during the day. Uh, the structure is 40 plus years old. This is a converted um, Arco station. This is the louver and the doors used to come in. There used to be a lift right here on the floor. I think that, that blue you see is some of the oil still coming out. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, the structure is 40 plus years old for a gas station. <coughs> Parking for vehicles is limited. The district often uh, resorts to storing operational vehicles at alternative locations. The district relies on street parking, primarily in the downtown area um, in Boulder Creek for personnel vehicles, which gets complaints from the business association because we take up um, important parking for the business town. The line treatment plant houses district laboratory services and treatment staff. Kirby plant houses Kirby treatment staff, which is another treatment plant. It really isn't, doesn't have office space, but we utilize it because we don't have office space. So as time moved on after a long uh, procurement process in August 2004, the district did uh, acquire uh, several APNs uh, referred to the Prosser site. Uh, and in December 2005, the district acquired uh, adjoining APNs referred to the Johnson site, which is the buildings down the street. Uh, and uh, they're side by side. Uh, the fifth and final parcel, which is contiguous uh, with the north of the Prosser site, was acquired in March 2007. Uh, these parcels were purchased to consolidate, upgrade the district's administration and operations facilities. Uh, moving along, and then in December of 2007, an architect uh, prepared an architectural master plan that outlined several existing conditions and identified future needs of a consolidation project. Plans and specifications were completed with an estimate construction cost of $6 million at that time. Uh, with a cost of $6 million, the project became very controversial, which probably all of you remember. Um, in January 2014, the board passed the following motion. Staff is directed to cease from further new spending on the administration campus project without prior approval of the board of directors. Uh, with the exception of ongoing maintenance of the existing facility and as far as I do believe that uh, resolution um, is still in effect. Uh, then on August 7, 2019, this subject was brought to the District's Administration Committee for review. It was recommended that we start the process over. The district has grown, technology has changed, board members and staff has changed, and given the amount of controversy raised with the project, a public advisory or ad hoc committee uh, is believed warranted. The committee voted to recommend to the board that a public advisory committee or an ad hoc committee be created for the sole purpose of developing district facility needs, plans, project, and making a recommendation to the board. 
Uh, the committee would be comprised of five to seven members of the public appointed by the directors of the Santa Rosa Valley Water District for the purpose of developing a, a district facilities consolidation plan project, making recommendations to the district regarding the needs for, for the district admin and operations. Uh, the committee would be undertaking a comprehensive review and make uh, recommendations kind of based on the following. And basically we would go back over, there has been a lot of work done, a lot of plans, a lot of engineering, um, a lot of studies done on what we need, the amount of space we utilize today with all of our facilities. And we would basically review, you know, how we got where we are today, the public input through, we would want, you know, want public input through a series of meetings possibly public workshops. The goals of the project would be going over critical needs we would discuss, needs for today's and the future. Existing uh, district facilities, we will get uh, these facilities appraised to see their value as we would vacate these value, uh, these buildings across the street and here if we, if we move. Uh, opportunities and constraints, key issues influence the design, you know, the sizes and design criteria for rooms in the building. Uh, remodel existing admin and operations facility or relocation. We've done all those studies and, and have a, a, a considerable amount of information that we could you know, represent to a committee to, to review and not have to re, re, reinvent the wheel. Uh, we would, a big discussion would go on the board of directors meeting room. You know, the last project, the campus project, had a, a dedicated board meeting room. They had a price tag estimated at a million dollars. You know, the thinking now is we have a multi-purpose room such as this that we can figure into the design somehow so we could use it daily and then have board meetings in, in the evening. It's just one of the things that we will be reviewing. <laughs> Environmental concerns, fuel, uh, fuel storage concerns, obviously estim estimated construction costs, the appropriate location for the district headquarters and operations facilities. There was a lot of discussion last time on that. Uh, consolidating repair materials and equipment to one location. They would be discussing uh, bulk water sales. The district does sell uh, a fair amount of bulk water sales, which bulk water sales are trucks, are uh, construction trucks, people who live off the grid who don't have a water supply that come in and haul. There is a fair amount of that. And it's problematic as it is now because the trucks line up in the street and they're a traffic issue. We don't have an off-street area like Nietzsche. We have a, a double park. During the drought, they were double parking all the way out to Highway 9, uh, so that caused issues. And then basically, you know, the district is a, a critical needs and it has 24-hour emergency uh, response, and that would be uh, be reevaluated by the committee again. But basically, it would be start over, but we would reuse and revisit all of the information that we already have. So we're not looking at a huge lift of expense or going out for studies and so forth. There may be a time down the end of the road that more information is needed or requested by the board that we may need some assistance by an engineer or some of the facilities needs expert. So the committee, the, ad, or the admin committee recommended that we bring this to the full board and move ahead with some type of public outreach committee or ad hoc. And um, staff has no recommendation on to how to move that forward and we'll have to turn that over to the board for discussion and possibly um, Council from district council on some of the ways to set those up. That's my presentation. <laughs> so this way, you keep talking about it. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> good thing. Uh, so yes, this was discussed at the admin committee, and how how it would work and. How many people we could have? Would it be too cumbersome? Um, so, it, you know, there's a lot of questions, and the committee recommended that we bring this to the board and get some ideas. Have you got some ideas for us, Gina, or do you want to hear what we have to say? Well, I can. I mean, I can outline some of the considerations, the legal considerations that go into how you form it. And for okay. one, an yeah. ad hoc committee would typically have an anticipated term of less than a year. So if you thought the committee could get its job done quickly, ad hoc might be a way to go. But if it's going to take longer, then it would typically be a standing committee. And so we would, in, in a lot of ways, similar to LADOC, and the way LADOC is described in the 
board policy manual. Um, the composition of the committee would affect whether it's subject to the Brown Act. Um, if you've got a majority of the board on there, it's definitely going to be subject to the Brown Act. If it's just two members of the public, it might depend whether it's a standing committee. Bob, you got a yeah, one of the things that, that we discussed is whether or not the admin committee itself would take that on, and it was felt that this was so specialized that, and, and that we needed to make sure we made it as, as broad as possible. Um, that was, I think, the basis for the recommendation. I, I do want to mention a couple of things just from a personal point of view that um, I'm very much uh, intent on making sure that we do not uh, replicate what happened in 2014 and even the updated um, study that was done in 2017 which accounted for I think six and 20 whatever it was 2014 and five million um, in 2017 as the, as the construction cost for implementing those particular things we simply cannot afford that that kind of uh, in my opinion cannot afford that kind of uh, facility so um, this would be done uh, hopefully at much lower cost, and I think that's what the committee is going to be charged with. So part of what we can also do as a board, I understand, is decide what the guardrails are. Yes, right? absolutely. And, and so at least those are two of my guardrails, so that it's not millions of dollars of, of uh, facility uh, infrastructure. Just to interject, the, the board way back many years ago gave direction, which probably that isn't the same as it is today, that they did give guardrails by saying they wanted it to be on Highway 9 corridor and they wanted to have sure. a bus available at the bus stop there. That was the two parameters that they gave the committees last time. Um, and that, that was the only two? That was the only two, that they didn't want to leave the Highway 9 corridor. They thought it was important and that bus service. That was before internet <laughs> and, and different things. Technology has changed. so. Well, there there was the the engineer uh, not engineers the architects report in 2017 that was just seemed kind of out there to me too much too much uh, I mean I uh, the district manager but he needs an office but he doesn't need. A gigantic room, and his secretary doesn't need a semi-gigantic room. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Although maybe he does need a gigantic room, but um, he, you know, he needs privacy and a secretary nearby. Um, but I, a lot of the other space can be open space. And, and that plan had a huge um, conference room and a, just a meeting room for the board to just come in and look at things. And I, I mean, it just seemed kind of a little over the top to me. Um, mm -hmm. Just my personal opinion. It's the facilities that really are driving this, the bathroom <coughs> facilities, ADA. Yeah. Um, yeah. The health of the building. Right. And the everyday working well, conditions I, are. We need a we need a new building. We I need totally need agree with that. We must have one. Well, well we, we think a new location, perhaps, and probably a new location. We 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 do have a good idea. We do have a lot of work that says our needs. That we went out and architects went out and measured all of our square footage that we're utilizing in all of our yards, all of our office spaces, and all the facilities, and put together numbers of what we need under the same roof. The number of parking spaces. Uh, there are a lot of things that went into that the campus project that really escalated the cost by going with a two-story building, a hundred thousand plus dollars in an elevator. Which I would try to, I hopefully we could get away, the committee could get away from an elevator to keep it a single story. 
the, the standalone boardroom was a million dollars. There was office space, there was a board chair's office. I mean, I, I don't think we need a board chair's office, but maybe the board chair believes we do. <laughs> That's what the, the committee will uh, discuss. Um, you know, we'll, we'll bring all this information to the committee. And they may say that, you know, the best recommendation is to move to the belt. I don't know. You know, we, we need to find out where the center of the district is and where it's best located for emergency response. I have a lot of experience in it, and, and the department heads will be part of that committee as the staff assist to help um, the committee. That's for sure. John, Barbara? I just have a, for a question, and maybe this was mentioned, but I didn't hear it. Uh, are you looking at a, a lease, or are you looking at a purchase? Or is that still open? I think that's all. I mean, my, my, my perspective, it would be, it, I don't think anything's off the table. Okay. I wouldn't want to restrict, you know, I don't think staff's job would be to restrict the committee. Perhaps, you know, you get five, ten people on a committee, you're going to get a lot of good ideas. A lot of crazy ones, but a lot of good ideas. Mm -hmm. And maybe a lease or something would be better. I don't know. I wouldn't Some want to restrict uh, yeah. for the committee. Okay. Thank you. Are we, have we, are we still on the board, or have we opened it up to the public? Because I have a comment tonight. Well, yeah, you can comment. Uh, I, I have, I'm ambivalent to the idea of an ad hoc committee. I mean, I think whatever you, whatever the admin committee agrees or suggests is would be would be fine with me. But I do have two recommendations. One is I think one of the options to consider seriously is the Johnson Building, and I feel strongly about that. Um, so if you could just add that to the... It'll be part of it. Okay. All of, our, all of our existing assets will be looked at. I just don't want to say, sit here and tell you that anything's off the table because that, that wouldn't be the point of having an exactly. ad committee. I'm, Everything is on the table, I would think. To include looking at the Johnson Building. And place. to include looking at all of our assets. The, the second thing is I really believe that right now the HR person does not sit in a closed office. And I think that type of person needs to have privacy because most of what they talk about is is private conversations. So, you know, if anybody needs a closed office, I think the HR person does. We're trying to address that now. But I agree. Thank you. Uh, question I have is, so would you be considering selling the administration building? Yes. So you did a pretty good job of saying the negatives of that building. Is it really... Uh, can you get good value for that? Back oh, roughly probably 15 years ago, we when we were discussing this on the campus project, we did get an appraisal <coughs> for both of these buildings. So this building came in at that time, snapshot in time, around I think it was around 700,000, and that one came in around 500,000. That was probably 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So part of this process would, if that was the recommendation, we would get an appraisal of the value of these buildings, because obviously that would be a big part. Yeah to put into the, to whatever we get. So Steve, did you have anything you want to say? Uh, no, I think, uh, well, I, I kind of like the idea of creating an ad hoc committee and working with us. I, I think it should be able to be accomplished within a year, you know, given all the material that already exists. And uh, if you have a good quorum of, of uh, or a group of uh, members that are hopefully creative in nature, you should be able to uh, Solve this uh, dilemma within a year's time, so I think an ad hoc committee would be appropriate. Lois, I think uh, I had something. To say. I just wanted to say that two years ago we actually surplused the admin building, and um, when that went on the you know out to the public, we um, got three calls that first week. Well, people still have their names and numbers on them. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is we can't find any resolution at surplus. Well, it was directed to surplus, but then it didn't. It would have needed to come back to the board again. Brian didn't bring it back. Yeah. So no, because I remember the the vote taken too good to surplus. Yeah. 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 Not the fact we ever brought it back. It appears we ever brought it back. We're trying to do research for this, okay. uh, but the surplusing these buildings is right. very easy to do. Yeah. 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 But the fact that. You know, three people were interested the minute they read that. It tells me that there well, is some interest. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. it's commercial property. It's commercially zoned. And both sides of the street have good functioning septic tanks versus some of the town has hallway systems. So that's a plus, too. So, you know, I think, I think we'll be able to 
Igen, a gálgyvállatban. Nem, szép sárta. Anybody else out there in the public? Virgil? <coughs> Sorry, yes, Virgil Chan. Uh, I'm I'm concerned about uh, forming forming a committee um, that doesn't have a clear goal, so that they know how to declare victory, and some kind of a time limit because things can go on and on and on forever. Now. By mentioning ad hoc, you're talking Latin that says for this. And I want to know what for this is. And why is the one year restriction? Okay, that would probably be just fine for this committee, but what happens if we had another ad hoc committee and it, um, it might have very clear goals and very clear ending dates that are two or two, three years from now? And there, I'd like to know that. There, well, there are usually temporary committees, and ad hoc doesn't really even have to follow the Brown Act. They don't have to have open meetings. You can decide to have it that way. But I personally really don't care for ad hoc committees for the very reason that they can be closed and nobody in the public even knows about them. And of course, that isn't what we want here. But we could have ad hoc, one year, uh, and it's open. It's just open. Uh, but normally, they're just temporary committees. And three years wouldn't be temporary. Yes, it would. <laughs> Okay. In geologic times, it's just a microsecond. <laughs> but I hope we have a my point, I, sorry, I, I wasn't clear enough, I guess, on my point. My point, me, ad hoc means for this. It has a, a simple charter, it has a simple goal that allows them to declare victory or failure, and it will probably need, as a backstop, um, a time limit. You guys aren't accomplishing anything, and you really aren't going to accomplish anything. The board of directors needs to take action to disband them. But it is for this. It is has a purpose, and that's what I mean. Maybe there's a legal, um, um, there's there's something in Black's Law Dictionary that redefines ad hoc, and and I'm unfamiliar with that. So, you know, maybe you know you could educate me. Well, it does have a purpose, like. Could have been the grand jury report, or you know, usually they do have a purpose. President Henry, if I could clarify, the agenda for tonight isn't set up to actually form the committee. I believe the purpose is to get direction from the board about the general direction and then bring uh, back. to go, and then there would be a much more specific item yeah. that would include okay. that. We could bring back the draft okay. charter and Hitler saying a specific purpose. I'm standard correct. No. <laughs> but, but I think I've heard uh, sort of a consensus around less than a year. Right? So yeah. I think it should be no more than a year, and we should be able to get, and I think it should be, I strongly believe it needs to be open to the public, mm -hmm. regardless if it's an ad hoc or the meetings need to be open to the public, yeah. advertised and follow our public notification. It right? has to be public I, because I, I of the bad press. And I agree. So maybe even scheduled workshops that we get through milestones. Uh, before we get too far down the road. Like if we pick a new location, if the committee picks a new location, maybe that would be a time to have a workshop to say, hey, to try to, we, we, we should develop some milestones and we make sure we get out to the community. Yes. I have one other question that had to do with um, the changes that have taken place in how uh, organizations work and the space requirements um, that are at least in the area that I work in, are very much different now than they were even 10 years ago. Um, I, I think I've mentioned before in a space about half the size of what we're table at. And one of the companies I work at, there's three vice presidents and a couple of uh, you know senior architects that sit in that area. Because there's not a lot of paper anymore. Every, everything's online. Um, that kind of examination of how the organization is going to be engineered has a direct impact on 
space requirements. Right. And when I look at the 2017 report, uh, which I went back and looked at, they were very much taking what I call a more traditional approach to space and requirement. Uh, another area is not so many private rooms, but lots of smaller conference rooms, or more than you would have had 10 or 15 years ago for those kind of one-on-one -on -one private conversations that need to take place. Um, hotel type facilities for staff that are moving in and out is I think we have staff that do that you know, during the day. So to me, the, the, the bigger issue around the facilities is not so much looking at um, just how much square footage is needed, is how are we actually going to organize the district to be able to take advantage of those new technologies and ways of doing business that may reduce the amount of space that we need for being able to get the job done. I think that would be a bullet point that would be looked at. I mean, I know it was looked at back when, because our storage was, you know, some of our shelving was 14, 15 foot tall. Yeah. And, you know, definitely unsafe. And we had to add on certain, you know, on, on, on parts and equipment. There's definitely issues with that in parking, you know, off street parking. And it has, the county has requirements. And even it's a, maybe a big parcel down the street, we barely have the room for the car in off street parking. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, because there needs, it needs to be looked at. And I don't doubt that that will be looked at. Is that, is that possible to do as part of the one year time yeah. period? Well, I don't see why it wouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, we may come back six months into it and say, my goodness gracious, we've got some real issues that we need some outside help or something. Um, okay. uh, there may be, you know, it, it may slow down and we'll just have to come back to the board. And I, if it is an ad hoc, ad hoc committee and we wind up going, you know, 18 months, um, but if we're making major progress and winding down, um, I'm sure it, uh, I'll refer to Gina, but. Well, if, it, if it's going to be public and subject to the Brown Act, then it doesn't make that much difference whether we call it ad hoc or not for right. that. So, under those circumstances, I would recommend um, setting it up as just sort of a temporary standing committee. Um, you could set any term limit that you want for it. I still don't think one year. Yeah, we'll, we'll, but the one thing by opening it to the public, it'll take longer just because of getting everybody's schedules together <coughs> and getting it. It has a tendency to take longer to be able to, to make those, those, those meeting goals. But it has to be open to the public. And I think we should be able to get close to the one. We know a lot of it done. Um, and I know senior staff has a lot of ideas and have been thinking about this for a long time. And we've got senior staff that have been here a while that know their needs today and we just need to get that conveyed to the committee. I mean, hopefully, we get people on the committee that have the time. That's a big issue time commitment. And have expertise. And I'll be looking for some engineers, you know, some people that uh, understood. Uh, hopefully, you know, you don't always get what you want, but some people get what they need. They, yeah, exactly. Because we had contractors before that came in and discussed it when we discussed the other project that were against the project and, and had a lot of ideas. And we could reach out to the community as well. Um, What's the idea for this to cost nothing, or is it no. to, that, like they may get to a point to where they need outside <coughs> consulting help or like an architect help to try and help assess? Well, especially on, on the office side or something, a standard or what is, you know, what size does it, do the bathrooms need to be? We have all that, a lot of that, but. Um, for ADA, we may need somebody, but that's something we can come back to the board and say, hey, we've got a, we've got a need for this, and um, here's how we want to move ahead and we'll get direction from the board. As close to zero as possible. That, well, that would be a good goal, yeah. but I'm not going to sit here and say it's or we can do it all for not good. nothing. There will be a cost somewhere involved, but I don't think it's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands. <laughs> yeah, I think it. it'll be a little cost, I hope. That it'll be a decision the board can make. All right. So we ready to move on here? Well, I'd like some direction of what you'd like to see staff to come back with a type of committee 
and maybe a makeup of how many people you'd like to see on the committee, and then staff and council will come back with a draft charter and some ideas. Yeah, I think we I think we do need to address that with further. We've talked about what's the what's the definition of success? What's the goal? Yeah, well, I can do that. Less than one year, cheap as possible. No. How many people? So uh, roughly. Five to seven sounded good to me. We were on the committee, seven. so that's right. Bad. Okay. Right. Because the longer you did it, the more well, difficult it, it, it is. It is more difficult. And people can, by having it open to the public, we can encourage, of course, everybody and anybody to come. So when do you want to have this on the agenda? On the 19th? Can we make the 19th? Oh, well. Okay, we'll, we'll try for the 19th. Okay. Sounds good. Next Thursday. Is that too soon? Yeah. Okay. I would just ask, what do you think about having a reevaluation after one year whether the committee should continue in existence as opposed to having a hard stop at one year? Yeah. Sounds good to me. I like the hard stop. But, uh, yeah. I, I like reevaluate. Why do a hard stop if they're almost somewhere? Because I don't want to be right now. Mm -hmm. I don't want to drag out either. I, mean, was, I, mean, staff I, I don't want it to drag, drag out. out either, but what if another month or two would... It's Parkinson's law. That's all. Okay. I just like to avoid it. Right. I'm overvoted. Undervoted. No, no, I think Blue said he was okay with it. Yeah. yeah. Extending. I just, I just find that when you do that, you... Time expands you give them to permission to extend? Yes. Is that what you're exactly. saying? And this needs to be done quickly for a whole host of reasons. Our employees have waited long. That's enough. correct. Okay. And I, and then you know if we get in the eight or nine months and see we need an extra month or two, I'm sure we'll come to the board and give on a given update and say where we're at. And okay. Okay. I think it's the intent of the board to see this one moving. Right. That's yes. for sure. And not just bog down, and, which we do get bogged down a lot. There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of projects. We're going to be really busy. This is a lot to take upon. Just my own personal thing. Uh, okay, so let's move. Do you have, do you have all the guidance you need? For now, yes. For now, we'll, we'll probably ask for more guidance formally uh, when we bring this back. On the night. Not, it'll give you the board time to think about if there's anything in particular that you want to throw out and uh, give us our, our guidance. Okay. Can we move on to um, district efforts for fire? Do you want to say anything? Okay. Right. This is uh, just a, a, a short update. Um, the board, uh, 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 Director Ferris and myself and uh, Mr. Larry 404 have been working and meeting and talking about uh, the district's efforts for fire prevention, fire management, um, planning, um, preparedness, uh, and our watershed. Um, we plan to take this back um, to the uh, environmental committee at the next meeting and most likely request uh, either a, a public uh, uh, outreach committee or an ad hoc committee to develop the plan uh, for the district. But I wanted to bring this back to the board and, and because I know it is a, an item of concern, not only with the board, but with the public. Um, we have been uh, working and discussing. We, we do have a considerable amount of uh, facility mapping done. We have our con uh, critical facility awareness plan done, where we have all of our facilities um, documented um, and mapped. Um, We've done some notification planning, uh, we're working on generator procurement. Uh, the board has uh, put in what, six or eight. eight generators in this budget. Uh, the uh, director of operations is working on putting together the formal bidding procurement for those uh, generators. Uh, we've done some customer outreach, uh, we've updated uh, operational procedures. A lot of our work has been done in response to the PG&E extended power outages. We feel that, that that is a high probability for this year, and that has the potential to impact 100% of the district customers. Um, in addition, in operation planning, uh, Director Ferris and uh, uh, 
Dr. Ford had been meeting uh, with us, like I said, with district staff, and uh, Mr. Ford has reached out to other agencies and got more documentation, more information. We're bringing it back to the uh, Environmental Committee, and I think Mr. Ferris and Mr. Ford may want to add to that. It's just a quick update. Yeah, I'd like to make a few comments. First of all, I want to make it clear that we do have, as you um, indirectly or indicated, we do have procedures on fire prevention planning. It's not like we don't. In fact, I brought one with me. This is the fire prevention planning procedure for the admin building. So it's not like we're, we're deficient in not having those procedures. It's just that given what's been happening the last two years with those fires up north and what PG&E said we could be without power for up to seven days, we need to clearly go back and revisit these with some priority. So that's why this memo was, was created. Second thing is, uh, given the fact that, uh, and, and I'm sad to hear this, to hear the news that Jen has resigned, we now do not have a, a environmental uh, manager. And that kind of puts in, in question in my mind whether or not we want to have an ad hoc or a public advisory committee. But, and first we have to talk with the, with the full environmental board about that, right. about how we, how we go forward, because that changes things, I believe. And, uh, and I think we've also, and I'll let Larry explain, I think there's also people out there that can assist us. Yes. And that we haven't, uh, we were probably waiting for the uh, environmental committee to discuss what's available to us. Um, so we, I, I think we hope we can still move ahead. Um, uh, we shouldn't let the loss of the staff member slow no. the process down. No, but it may change some of the things we said. I agree. Was all I'm saying. It'll make it more difficult for right. that about. Exactly. Uh, and speaking about people helping us, uh, I would like to say some words about Dr. Ford and his effort over the last month to, to six weeks because I am just blown away by the, the help that he's given us. And just to give you a sense of what's happened in only about a six-week period of time, he provided, you know, we've had several meetings. He provided Rick and I with multiple documents, you know, of relevant background from Santa Cruz County, from Cal Fire, from Contra Costa County, from Diablo Fire Safe Council, and from the California National Resources Agency. Uh, and it took a while to digest a lot of that information. In addition to all that background documents, he went out and, and actually made a proposal for a consultant who could help us in this regard in terms of moving this forward fast uh, uh, because you know, obviously we don't want to rely on Larry because he's doing this out of the kindness of his heart right now. Uh, and I think we've actually reached out to this, to this person. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mention the name, but uh, I think that was a, a great uh, plus that you, that you gave to us. And you know, <laughs> the next is he actually proposed the planning process with three steps. A, assessment of the, the fire management needs that we have. B, supplemental assessments, and C, the fire management plan update from what we currently have. So, and, and then the last but not least, he's helped us with procuring grant money as well. So it's just, <laughs> it's amazing to me how far we've come in the last month, and we clearly couldn't have come anywhere near this, this point without Dr. Ford's efforts. So, you know, thank you. For, the, for the district, I would like to publicly thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Can I add a few things? Absolutely. <laughs> um, didn't expect that part. Uh, I just wanted to let you other board members know that I'm really pleased with this informal discussions that we've been able to have. Um, really pleased with the opportunity to be able to apply my my own expertise to this these challenges, but um, also. Uh, I think we did have really productive meetings. Um, I wanted to re-emphasize, especially for the other board uh, board directors here, that uh, we're just we just hit the the beginning of the peak of the fire season. Um, it's almost September. You remember the most of the fires last year and the year before were in the fall. So there's a weather forecast for high winds and high temperatures over the next couple of weeks. And last time I looked. Anyway, I think this is really urgent, and there could be a, a catastrophic fire that sweeps through the valley that goes beyond the, the heroic and amazing efforts of the firefighters. You know, I mean, they're prepared to swoop in with 747 tankers, you know, and all this stuff. 
but uh, it could be it could be worse than that. Um, you know, the governors declared a state of emergency. Um, the leading fire scientists that I uh, work with say that we have a 50% increase in fire fuels this year compared to last year. So that means bigger fires, you know, spreading faster, all these kinds of things. So I'm really worried about it, not just for my home, but for the whole, for the whole valley and all of us who live here. Um, next, I just wanted to say, Rick didn't tell you everything that I discovered or that I was informed about that they have accomplished. It's amazing to me. So I would say that the fundamentals of operations and infrastructure, they're really on top of it. I wanted, I wanted to add to his list that they've done a, a, an analysis of the vulnerability of various parts of the, you know, of the water system. Things like, what if a fire swept through here? What, what would happen to some of the um, pipes that are up on the, above the, the surface of the ground? that might release chemicals and cause, you know, that whole area to have to be shut down and, uh, you know, not even just boil water, but they, they couldn't drink it. Anyway, that's really, that kind of stuff is really important. Other things like, you know, tanks that could have some tree fall on it and then burn and then be completely unserviceable. All these kinds of things I heard about. Um, there are, the term, that's used is fire flow. That means how do you get water to the fire hydrants that are needed to put fires out? They're working on that. That's all part of the infrastructure improvement plan. It's not there yet, but it's part of the plan. Um, uh, they've already collaborated with uh, Cal Fire. Rick was telling me that, the, that Cal Fire doesn't necessarily want to have him show up, but he's prepared to show up probably, you know, with you, James, you know, as soon as that fire starts, you guys will be there and you'll be trying to, you know, help guide the emergency people, you know, to work on putting out the fire. Um, let's see. I also was very impressed with this preliminary fire management plan, Chapter 5 in the Watershed Management Plan that I think Jen and Betsy before her had worked on. Very good. Um, it's incomplete. There's some zones, you know, of the water district that weren't included. Um, also impressed with some of the fire management planning that has been done by other agencies in the valley, or including the valley, notably the Santa Cruz County RCD with the San Mateo County RCD, putting together this uh, community wildfire protection plan. And there's a recent update. but. Anyway, all this is not enough. I mean, it's, it's the fundamentals for infrastructure and for operations, but it doesn't cover um, several other things, notably the incredibly high uh, fuel load that we, that we have in this valley that we need to deal with, and it needs to be de dealt with in a cooperative way. So um, here, here are my, uh, mostly for the benefit of your other board, board directors, um, uh, sorry, I'm mixing up terms here. Um, so we need we need further assessments of the watershed conditions, not not just infrastructure, but the watershed, um, fuel loads, um, things like that. But also um, things like access for firefighters, access for the water district maintenance people um, during and after fires. Um, we need some more. Uh, hardening of the facilities to resist a uh, fire if it does come through. And then I think the, um, the one thing about this valley that I know somebody is studying it, I forget who, but it's going to be the evacuation. You know, when this big fire comes into the valley, how are we going to get everybody out? Because there's no way to do it. There's no good way. And so there needs to be a big cooperative effort that includes the water district to to solve some of these kinds of problems. And then going beyond that, um, actually starting to control those fire hazards, the fire fuels. Um, which ones, you know, what areas are the greatest risks? Usually fire managers, fire scientists, they start with a 
a risk analysis. So, okay, you've got all these fuels, but where would the fire start and where would it sweep under different weather conditions and uh, time of day probably, you know, related to commuter traffic, things like that. And, uh, and then a lot of cooperation with these other agencies is going to be needed. It can't just be at this level, it can't just be the water district. It has to, you know, because these, these fuel loads spread out over the whole watershed regardless of ownership. Anyway, then lastly, um, one of you mentioned that uh, there are a lot of state grants available right now. So this doesn't have to cost the district a lot. Or you don't have to worry. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure this is true. Um, you don't have to worry about it costing a lot to get, get going because there's big bucks. But they're going to require that you cooperate with the other agencies. So it's going to be this coordination role, uh, process. And that's why Rick was mentioning that we need to have somebody probably on some contract that would facilitate this whole process. So um, I'm, I'm really pleased about it. At the same time, having my adrenaline level up because we're you know entering into the fire season now, but the, for the worst of it. So thank you for letting me give that introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Oh, just one last comment. I'd like to say that you can anticipate recommendations from the Environmental Committee in the near future. If not next week, we're kind of up against it as far as the agenda for next week, but certainly the, the one after that and probably the one after that. Both for in terms of uh, maybe changing the makeup of the Environmental Committee now that we've lost a member, as well as asking for monies that are not budgeted. Something I know we're reticent to do, but we haven't got there yet. Right, we haven't got there yet. Uh, yes. <laughs> we'll try. Um, what, what do we what do we think is the ultimate scope of what we're trying to protect against here? I mean, there's there's many different kinds of fires. So there's house fire, there's sort of small brush fire. There's at the other end of the spectrum, paradise style wildfire, which would be devastating for the community. Where, where do we fit in planning for fire prevention? And of course, these projects that are going in are going to be hybrided up. The well, these projects are going in are huge for fire. Yeah, well, right. They're, they're going to. So, but where do we fit in that? Well, there's several different protection. There's several different points to. I mean, the, the basic structure of fire. You know, we have fire hydrants or whatever, in which. We don't have a lot of at the backbone of the system, and the fire. You got to remember, the fire departments all drill and train for areas without water and so forth. And you know, I, me personally, I'm not worried about the structure fire. I'm worried about the watershed fires, and I'm worried about the PG&E potential PG&E power outages. So more wildfire. Things. More wildfire okay. fires. They're, because they're not going to really tax the district's distribution system because that would be fought by air hand crews. Dipping a lock woman and those type of things. But they have the potential to cause obviously a lot of problems in terms of catastrophic, to burn our intake lines. You know, all of our intake lines are above ground HDPE pipe, which HDPE pipe, when they got too hot in the Northern California fires, released a toxin and they pretty much had to replace it all. Um, there's quite a bit of articles on that. Um, but the PGE power outages and what Larry said too, if you do an evacuation or start getting even to a point where people are fearful and evacuating, we're not going to be able to operate and move around. Yeah. You know, there's going to be panic. You'd be shelter in place. I mean, I think Lampico, I've heard several people say that Lampico just came out on a list that they're yeah. one of the top areas, number two, number two yeah. for problems on evacuation. Um, so there's a lot of different problems associated types of things that we're looking at. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at pg and power outages. And that's something we have to plan for and be ready for. And that's something that could happen this year. But if I can follow up on the, on the wildfire stuff then, it's sort of then fuel related, right? right. So, so in that sense, since a lot of our property butts up against um, state right. land, 
some federal land? Uh, parks, uh, state parks. Yeah, so are they committed to, I mean, we obviously would have to eliminate fuel off our, well, fuel so breaks are, are huge, the removal of ladder fuels, um, evasive, you know, eucalyptus trees, you know, our, our, our north watershed is pretty heavy, is obviously heavily timbered. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Southern Oak Gap has left a lot of fuel yeah. out in, uh, on, on the watershed. Yeah. So that's all going to have to be evaluated. And then you're going to start getting into a heavy lift. Yeah, but then you partner. You partner with state parks, you partner with CDF, whatever, to remove ladder fuels and, and are, they different committed, things. are they committed to that? The well, I think they are right now. Okay. You know, and obviously every time you have a, a huge event, such as the Northern California fires, it's on everybody's mind. And, that, and as Larry said, there's a lot of money available. But the, the whole, I think, the whole thing you, we need to realize, we just strike by the iron's hot. Yeah. You wait, we wait too long and say you don't have the fire in three or four years, you're going to see less and less money and enthusiasm to get together and do things. Um, but um, there are a lot of agencies then, you know, Cal Fire and CDF, they're doing using a lot of the, the, the CYA crews and so forth for cleanup of ladder fuels and, and that type of stuff. Okay. But that's going to be a heavy lift for this district because you're going to need, you're going to, need to coordinate and, Work with agencies. Just to, to add to what Rick has already said, because I've thought about this a little bit, and one of the things I wanted to present at the next environmental committee meeting is what are our priorities when it comes to fire prevention planning? And I think uh, Larry was talking about hardening our facilities. Yeah. I think our number one concern has got to be destruction of district facilities and equipment that would make it even worse. In other words, no, no water will flow, and you have to bring in tankers to fight fires. That's my biggest concern, is, is right. destruction of, of our capacity to deliver water. And a second would be ladder fuels on our land. Like I saw the, the Olympia watershed for the first time last Friday. It's a beautiful area, but it's also a, a, you know, a great at risk for fire. Bases. And then lastly is assisting other agencies when fires do break out. Because we're not the primary firefighting tool, but we can certainly assist in a lot of ways. So that's kind of my priority. That's great. You know, one of the things we're doing is we're changing our standard and looking at what it would take to, to get rid of all our wood pump stations, our wood structure pump stations. And our standard now is blocked. Anything new that goes in or remodeling, but we still have a, a significant amount of wood pump stations out there. And we probably need to accelerate getting rid and of those wood and look at that, put together you know, a, a cost matrix and see what that would take to. To improve and grant grants, grants, of course, possibly. Um, but yeah, those types things. of things would that would harden up our system. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of the redwood tanks, um, uh, and there's and our SCADA system, making sure that's functional without power and without lease lines and so on, certain things. Because I, when the panic comes in the San Bernardino Valley and in Lompico in our areas, I don't think staff's going to be able to move. It's going to be a real problem, and then there's areas we don't want to send staff in for safety reasons. In other words, if we haven't prepared, there's nothing we can do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even if we're prepared. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, we hope it never happens, but that we can't just bury our head in the sand. We have to plan. And our operations department has been planning on the operational for some time now. We have really good tight operationals, and they can tell you how long a generator has to be in one given area to pump X amount of gallons of water. And then how soon you'll have to move to another area. We've got, we've got a response plan. But now we got to be able to move. You know, moving a generator is a truck and trail. So. Uh, Steve, are you still with us? Yep, I'm still here. You got any comments? <laughs> no, no comments. Okay, thank you. Nothing at this time. Any comments out there? Yes. Uh, Jim Mosier from Felton. I just, first of all, I want to commend uh, Director Ferris and and uh, uh, Rick and Larry for taking on this issue. I, it's an issue that is, I think, just got to be a huge, huge concern for us in the valley. I have a friend who uh, lives half time up in Northern California and has experienced several fires. He wrote an article. You may have seen it in the, in the Good Times about a year ago, in which he interviewed fire chief. Fire uh, chiefs around Santa Cruz County, and this is a concern across the valley. His estimate is it's not if we're going to have a wildfire up here, but it's a matter of when. And we've learned a lot about how to address those. 
uh, how, to, how to lessen the, the, uh, the uh, scope of them. Uh, but he really impressed upon me the importance that we've got to be planning now. And it seems to me we in the Water District have a really important role to play. Uh, and I think it's fortunate that we have as much uh, uh, watershed land that we can directly uh, reduce the fuel of, because that's something, at least my friend says, is so important. Um, and uh, we can be, uh, you know, the other agencies are going to be helpful, but we're the agency that knows the valley. Uh, and our staff at the Water District knows this valley so well and knows what the resources are and what the risks are. So that us taking the lead in the collaboration and cooperation that you all are talking about, I think it's just critical. So I'm really glad that this is happening. And I think you'll find a lot of support in the community for it. Uh, you know, when I hear Rick talk about the evacuation problems, and, you know, my hair goes straight up. Of course, it already is going straight up. <laughs> Uh, even even more. So it's just it is it is a frightening prospect to me, and I think it is one with climate change coming that it, having the district take a lead in this. Uh, you know, I think uh, there is a lot of money out there. I, I can believe that, and I hope we can get it. But I know from my grant writing world, it takes money to grant to get money. So uh, yeah. it may take some investment uh, and some. But I really uh, hope we can take leadership in this, and I really commend the board for tackling it. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. okay. so we're going to need a new one. Mm -hmm. Short of that. I've talked too much, so the Director of Operations will take this item. Oh, we will, huh? Okay. It is recommended <coughs> that the Board of Directors review this memo and by motion of the Board approve the purchase of a skid mounted racking excavator from Hitch Witch West for a total of $24,306.45 and authorize the district manager to execute the purchase. The background on this is the 2019-20 fiscal budget provides $25,000 for the purchase of a skid mounted vacuum excavator to be utilized in the water distribution department. Vacuum excavation loosens the soil with a blunt nosed high pressure air lance or water source and immediately vacuums away loosened material. Air and water, when used appropriately, are far less likely than sharp edged tools to damage underground structures. This type of excavating is quickly becoming recognized as the best practice when working in areas with underground utility congestion. Soft excavation technology can dig around buried pipes or cables without the risk of damage and the risk of damage inherent with backhoes, excavators, or other mechanical tools. This will save the district money and time in spoil material, backfill material, asphalt, and man hours. A vector truck is capable of digging out leaks, meters, valves, etc., with a lot less impact. Staff solicited three price quotes for a skid mounted vacuum excavator as follows. Press tech, $25,350.95 with a 15 to 18 week delivery. AUI rents, $21,465.37 with a 6 to 7 week delivery. Ditch Witch West, $24,306.45 with a 2 week delivery. Staff is recommending not taking the lowest price quote from AUI rent because of the estimated delivery time of six to seven weeks. And purchasing from Ditchwich West due to specifications, a week, two week delivery, and the price difference of $2,850.08 more than the AUI rent. Thank you, James. Uh, you know, uh, Rick showed me a video of how this works. It's just fascinating. Um, also, you didn't mention it saves on worker comp claims from guys digging. It does. Yes. Although um, the nozzle does get very heavy as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, what you guys are doing. So, um, Anyway, I, I was really impressed with this. Uh, so, any comments here? I, I, I've seen one of these things in operation in removing trees. 
and they were trying to remove this tree and put it, they were going to put it back. And this uh, machine was able to uh, save the fine root hairs that are so critical to easy um, regrowth of a tree. And I was amazed. It was a very soft touch to digging into hard ground. And um, it did save the backs of uh, digging deep and hard, and it's, you know, relieves the possibility of danger to pipes and stuff like that. This is a great thing. I've done enough uh, work in my dad's water system when I was a kid to so never been. If I had something like this, it would have made the job a lot easier. Because when you get down around the pipe, it's like you got to go by hand, scraping it around, it just gets a pain. So, I mean, I think that's why we've approved it in the budget before. Um, I guess I had a couple questions here about is there, a diff are these three different um, Machines, brand machines, or are they the same machine, just three different prices? No, they're so they're three different brands. And Each one of them's a different brand, and they all have different little tweaks in, in their specifications that are different. So, like the PSI of the pressure nozzle is different on each one. Um, the size of the water storage tank for the pressure nozzle is different on each one. Uh, the fuel tank size is different on each one. And the suction motor size is the same on two and different on the ditch which one. It's a little bit bigger. So the ditch which has better specs is what you're, what That's, you're saying. We did come to that determination as well. When you so the preferred specs. I'm not going to say better specs. Preferred specs for the ditch. Okay. I'm not sure what the difference is between preferred or well, better. I'm not going to say they're better because I mean, what's better? <laughs> well, we haven't have used the other. Yeah, the ditch I mean, which has. I can't a, say it's a, better. A, 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 well, reputation, a reputation of having great equipment. And did we go back to them and say, hey, dudes, you know, drop your price a couple thousand dollars? Yeah, well, well, when we did yeah. start, when we started to get the quotes the first time, we've been working on this for about a year now, mm -hmm. in order to get prepared for budget. And when we started with Ditchwich, they were at $30,000. Mm -hmm. And so then they, when, when it got started getting more serious and serious, all the quotes actually went down a little bit, except for the one for a, from AUI went up just a little bit. because. They ended up putting in the nozzle, which was not included with the fat scale. But they, they said they wouldn't change the prices or anything like that. So like I said, I mean, they started at $30,000 and they came down to $24,000 by the time it was all set up. Is, is it possible after we get these three bids to go back and say, hey, guys, can you do this? Uh, practice of the district has not been to do that. And is so, it, is, it legal, done is it legal to do? Uh, there's nothing to prevent asking the question. If it, if yeah. okay. I mean, just a policy level, well, I just like to get deals. Uh, uh, we've tried you know, bid shopping in the past, and what's happened, especially on our inventory list, yeah. uh, cherry picking, whatever, then we wind up where bidders stop bidding because. This, See, they, this is different. Yeah, this is a more one time thing. This is true. We don't buy well, a lot. Well, we of might want to have two of them. I asked already if we could go back and get two at the, for the price of one, but Rick said we would need, we would need another truck as well. We have the truck already. Yeah, that's the difference okay. in this one. I mean, but the, in order to purchase another one, we'd have to purchase another forty-five dollars to $50,000 truck. Oh, to go okay. With it. So you're looking at a $75,000 purchase <laughs> in order to run another back scale. And if we were to go with another factor, we'd probably want to go with a bigger factor, like a real factor truck, like a huge factor truck. Okay. But it's kind of too big for this topography here. To yeah, get up some of the roads. roads. Exactly. So those bigger factor okay. trucks are really big. I okay. guess without beating it too much, is on things like this, going back and asking for it's different than no, I cherry picking than bid shopping. Shopping. I, I yeah. get that. But there are times when it makes sense. But anyway, okay. Okay. Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, I believe we should accept the recommendation from staff for this piece of equipment. Okay. How about you, Steve? I agree. With Lou? I was not that about accepting the uh, recommendation from staff and purchasing the ditch with West for 24K. Okay. And yeah. the board member? I agree. Okay, Lou, you want to make a nomination? Uh, not a nomination. Uh, oh, sorry, Virgil. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I have always been impressed with the way staff evaluates things. And um, they do their due diligence. They're really good at that. Um, they know what they need. And they know how to judge quality for their equipment. If they think the ditch witch is a better one for, for quality reasons, they probably can actually explain it to even me. But the concept that they can deliver it four weeks faster doesn't fly so much. Drop it. Go with your quality. Do it. Well, the quality is the shortest delivery time. Oh, I'm not going to win this one. I need to do it. Okay. So, a motion, to a motion to buy. To accept the recommendation of staff dated August 28, 2019, regarding the purchase of the vacuum excavator. I, I would make that motion. Okay. I'll second that motion. It was one of my first day actions here. Well, I'll probably uh, use it in a week on the drive. <laughs> so, uh, Holly, you want to call the question? Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Swan? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, next thing is minutes. And uh, unless somebody wants to yank the minutes for any reason, they're on the consent agenda, so we can just move on, right? Now, is the consent all the minutes that are there? Yeah. yeah, I think I might have had one um, small correction on the minutes. The minutes are split up into two. Oh, okay. committee. Oh, sorry, committee minutes. I, my correction is on committee. Yeah, committee meeting. Yeah. Not part of the uh, consent agenda. No. no. They're not. in Cucamonga, I think. Are we going to Looking accept the minutes right. then? Yeah, no. we are. No pull. Um, so, department status reports. Engineering, you got a report? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you do? Included in the, in the do, do you want to kind of highlight it for us, or do I mean, you are just that's in the report? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's not, I mean this, a lot of these uh, projects we've brought before the board before. It's right. sort of an update on yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. But if you have any specific questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Mm -hmm. And Darren will use them at the engineering committee meeting, meeting yeah. as well. Okay. Two, two questions. Oh, we have two. Um, so we're going to have a big opening ceremony for the probation tank. <laughs> Never get done. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we get some uh, pictures on Facebook. Please. Well, they haven't built a tank yet. We're still at foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's all right to say, huh? Yeah, the ring, we're a little ring foundation yeah. was back to the back We're having some issues, and we're probably extended. We haven't extended the contract, but um, they're about a month, two months behind. Is October still the date now, though, or is it? No, 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 no. I don't think so either. But it's, it's you know, the out. tank is their specialty, so maybe after they get the foundation done, they'll scoot right along. But at least they're now working five days a week instead of four days a week, which was a problem. Okay. And what are the what's the completion date for the PRVs in Lumpy? So we're supposed to start on September third, just after Labor Day. Uh, it was estimated that they would do one a week, so it'd be six weeks from. It'll be middle of no, uh, November. We recently had some delays in the PRVs themselves. Looks like we're going to be delayed another two weeks to receive the PRVs that we'll be installing. So it looks like right now my best guess is the end of November for completion. It's so probably starting mid, um, start mid September, end of October. Yeah. <coughs> All right. End of questions? 
You said you had two. That was two. Okay, you had your two. Um, so, finance, uh, is, do you have anything you want to say to us? Or it, it, it does have the preliminary full year numbers. Revenue right. numbers shouldn't be changing really as much. There will still be some changes to um, the expenses. Are, we still have some accruals to post the prior year, and then when the auditors come, they do some of the um, GASB 68, some of the actuarial entries that we, that we then end up posting for the pension. Um, so there will be some changes still to those, um, but in general, it at least is giving the, the snapshot view that things did come in line with what we were expecting. Um, whenever we go through and do the budget process, we do a revised forecast of what we think this year's actuals are going to end up at, and so it looks like those are coming in um, pretty close. Um, one thing that is definitely interesting is if you look at consumption, uh, we did have that late rainfall in May, if people recall, and June was 18% below the average consumption. So it's not very common that we have a big old late rainfall like that. And so I mean, we definitely did see people not having to turn on their irrigation or do, you know, water their gardens. Um, so it just does kind of go to show how much that type of stuff can impact the district on consumption. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I got more than you from I have just one question. Mm -hmm. Looking at uh, your packet part, there are 31 pages of outstanding invoices and, and check rights out of 186 <laughs> pages total in the packet. That's almost 20%. How many questions do you get for, for that section, the outstanding invoices and check rights. I mean, it seems like the, from my recollection of board meetings and even committee meetings, that nobody seems to ask any questions about those those pages. Well, I'm just, my suggestion is not to get rid of them. It's to put them on the website instead of killing killing trees by having you know increasing the the packet by twenty percent every year. We are required to put the AP outstanding, the you know the AP aging on there. Um, but it was something that then at least gives the, the foresight of the things that are about to be getting paid. And then the actual check register is something that we do, that we do have to do is to show what, what, what was paid. Mm -hmm. But what's the value of having it as part of the, the, the board agenda? Well, and part of it is required. Most of it's not wanted. So the AP outstanding is not. But, but, uh, the, okay. but essentially, so that, you know, the check register being there is a required piece for the but, board to review at a board meeting. Okay. Okay. I look at those bill pays sometimes, and I don't necessarily bring it up here, but I'll ask a question. Yes, yeah, sometimes. And I, I want to know what what was this money spent for, why did we do it? And that's why it's there, because our main job is a fiscal responsibility. And I understand that, but if it's on the website, it's still available, it's just not... Well, as far are, as the book part goes, we at least did start breaking out the bill list from the financial summary, the so right, people are able to at numbers. least click to step a little yes. bit. Anyway, I just I just had to ask that because it's always there. Yeah. It's the part that I never that I never print out because it, it's massive. Oh, I I look at it. Well, we had calibration from wine country. That was wrong. Yep, that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, I that was one of mine. <laughs> I said, what is this? And different sports in the past, and some of them have been very, very interested and gone down, and you know, others haven't. There are certain ways to get around having a, you know, quote unquote bill list on it. It does get interesting because I have looked over the hill to see what some of them kind of do, but I mean, in general, for the most part, you'll see every single public agency having their warrant bill list, whatever they call it, um, on the agendas. Never mind. And for me, it was a great way to introduce myself to what really goes on. It's just mm -hmm. seeing the nitpicky stuff that is uh, paid for and stuff like that. It's a great insight into the water district. Yeah. And I, I like to look at it, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm with James. I thought, what is that? Wine country. Bob had a couple questions. Yeah, I have a few questions yep. to go through. Because um, I wasn't this another million dollar um, month, or is that coming up? Uh, we have one. We've had just, quite a few coming through. Yeah. I mean, we've had this we're, is around the time that we have a lot of our yeah, loans getting. We have loans getting paid. Um, you know, we'll get 
we've been getting a couple, you know, 100, 150, you know, hits with the with the probation tank project. So it's not terribly uncommon. A lot of times, this is the time of year that you'll have um, consultants sending in year end is typically when they're sending in a lot of their invoices. So all of a sudden, you know, a couple twenty five thousand dollars here and there. I'm yeah. sitting at a very large bill list usually at the end of the year. Yeah. It's long. Our fiscal year. So on the quarterly week adjustment report, how does that how does that compare historically? And and do we capture when we do that sort of what the lead was? And the reason I'm asking is that you know part of part of the friction that occurs between the public and the district is around leaks, right? And so um, you know I've had in my mind the the need to be educating people proactively on what to do about making sure you don't get into a leak situation. Um, are we, is it getting worse? Is it about the same? It's about the same. I mean, it's, it was this whole year the district um, gave back $42,000 to the customers that had leaks. It's roughly around $10,000 per quarter. Um, the report does state, we'll say, how the leak was detect detected. The majority of the time is it is SLB staff. You know, we get the meter reads back. Identify a high usage, send someone out. But, but what about what the cause of the leak was? Was it a service do, line? A toilet, I mean, their sort of cause of the leak is in the report. So it's saying a leak on some of the service line, a toilet leak. Um, service line, a lot of times, is, you know, the common use had a water heater leak. So I mean, yeah. it, do, it does, they do have to tell us what the leak was. It's all over the place. Too. And you got to understand the houses in this valley and their service lines are just as old as the oh, system understand. in this valley. So those pipes are just as old as our pipes. I understand. <laughs> that's, one of the, exact it, here. that's one of the reasons why it's my, an education thing that maybe the admin committee takes up is to basically tell people, look, if yeah. your pipes are this, and I don't know if we can tell them that or not, if we can help them that. If they're bad, we need to replace them. So we get the knowledge out there for sure. Uh, yeah. Stephanie and I have been talking about this report just recently quite a bit. And we think that we need to accelerate the change to the bathroom meter that has the ion water that can keep our customers. I would like to see us if we get maybe move ahead, accelerate that program. Not sure where the money's going to come from yet. But then once you get the meter, we dial back our leak adjustment policy and put you know responsibility on the on the owner. Yeah. But it's starting to get to be it is increasing. So these know. are not badger these are badger these are badger these, 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 these are right. be. what I'm talking about is is there a way proactively for the district to basically say to the community, look, under these conditions, this is what you're likely to have, the least yeah. toilets this old, service line this old, you know, your irrigation, watch that carefully, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we could add, I mean, we could, um, we do have stuff on the website for how to find a leak or how to help identify. I mean, it wouldn't be very difficult to add a section on, you know, know your pipe, something, you know, something along those lines. It gets a little bit tricky. We do have a high volume of uh, tenant, you know, type, type of accounts, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're not thinking about their service line until there's a problem. But we do oh, also right. then know who the owner yeah. is. You know, so I mean, we could, it could be dual messaging to where you're trying to get to the, the owner. And I, I don't know if people know this, but um, thank you very much for the uh, new graph on the 13 month consumption trends. So basically what this is showing here is, is breaking out the various categories and also <coughs> putting in forecast and, and budget so that you can see Hey, if, uh, as you can see, our actual units are way below in, in uh, May and June, uh, this impacts at a financial level. We don't, I, don't, I don't need to look at numbers in detail. I can kind of look at this and say, how are we doing? And that is fabulous improvement. I like to see uh, more graphs on a lot of the reports that we're doing because it just helps communicate <coughs> the information faster, right? And that's part of what we're trying to get to. Um, let's see. I understand. I have just a couple more here. <coughs> you know, when people complain, we don't ask enough questions. Right? So. As you get to that, we will do, once we have more final numbers, we will do an analysis <coughs> of um, the full year actuals versus budget. Yeah, I understand. That, and that's fine. Um, okay, um, on a couple of the bills, um, County of Santa Cruz Health Services. 
Steelhead and stream monitoring, is that the ongoing fish monitoring program that we've been doing? That's that? correct. Right. Okay. And so that was like the last quarterly payment. Right. Well, only quarterly payment. It's our annual. It's our annual payment. Our annual payment. It was only that we, that we agreed to last Four thousand dollars. Was what I'm showing that, here. That's for the program with the county. That's not the flow and temp monitoring. Oh, okay. So that's a program with the county that we contribute. To. Okay. Um, Finnack and Brown, what kind of? Okay. Um, That's Steve Passaway then? Might, might be, you might have to call in. You might call back. I noticed that we're getting a lot of separate invoices for internet services. It looks like and we make separate payments for those. Is there a way to consolidate that or is it all? Um, I don't think they sum their bill yet. Like pg &E will sum their bill and I don't believe. I had to jump through a heck of a hoops to get pg &E to right. summary bill yeah. more recently. Really? Yeah. Um, they don't do yeah. summary bills? It was under. Wow. Because that just increases all the, uh, and these checks, are these manual checks? They'll they get, well, so depending on where you're looking, they should be getting more so, well, I take it back. Some of them do go to different individuals, yeah. uh, depending on when they come in, the timing of them all. Yeah. We've been trying to work with them on getting them on at least the same timing same. schedule, so we're not getting just... A dozen bills. Yeah, because this month. just increases our processing mm -hmm. costs, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you don't have any choice. Well, but that's yeah. where you go back, and I'm just curious. That's all. Um, let's see, a couple more here. I think there was a couple of Nossum invoices. Um, yes. And I was wondering if those for last year or for this year? Um, it year. has date. This bill, yeah, it should, this, those are likely to be, those are the payments for the prior. Yeah. Month or so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's normally dates. Well, there's a date of payment on here. Right? No, That's but I mean, that. it normally says what the time period is. Uh, not what I was looking at. It's the Nossum check number 17744. I couldn't tell. What, oh, here's disbursements for 531. Yes, so that 34,000. Then is on last year's bill, and that would be associated right. with a lawsuit. That's right. That right. was the month we had the mediation. Yeah, yeah, that was a big right. one. That was a big one. So that would have been one that got accrued back into the prior year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I see you have a report. Yes, and um, I was asked to point out, to uh, bring to the board's attention that the county did, the county board of supervisors did approve uh, the district's conflict of interest code that was most recently revised in uh, late May, I believe. So that has now been officially approved by the county. Okay. So that's a higher level of disclosure in the case of a conflict of interest. Correct. Right. Just so you guys know. Mm -hmm. You know what? I take um, conflict of interest training. It's no worry. And maybe this is a good Unless time. you get an attorney who doesn't know what they're talking about, well, we don't have that kind. Of and, and maybe this is a good time to reiterate, uh, Mr. Moran, who's now joined the board. If there are any questions around conflicts and how to interpret that policy, please consult me sooner rather than later. You probably are familiar with it from your time on the committee. Yes, I think that I would use you as a resource. Uh, James? No, I have a question. Oh, for, sorry. For Gina. On note two of page one of your report, you talked about um, other law firms being represented through you. Are, are you the clearinghouse for all? Law firms that we use? I typically coordinate with any other attorneys that may be employed by the district um, for purposes of, at a minimum, kind of overseeing the work that they're doing for the district. Um, oh, I didn't. So, for example, I spend small amounts of time on a litigation matter that um, I am not handling, but SDR may have some of those attorneys to handle. Just to make sure that we're all singing from the same book. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that was at the direction of the, the board? Okay. Um, 
Are we in? Okay, James? Um, I'll just point out that there was three leaks in the last month that were significant water losses. Uh, one on Two Bar Road of 39,000 gallons, one on Bear Creek Road of 29,000 gallons, and one on Zion School Road of 45,000 gallons. Kind of half and square. Okay, thank you. So, um, Two committee re Two. Yes. Two questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, on page 126, the uh, production comparison chart that you've got, James, mm -hmm. it looks like, I mean, this could be for other reasons, it could be for seasonal reasons, it could be, you know, because you've shut down certain wells, but it looks like we've shifted, at least for the month of July, from 2013 to 2019, we've shifted dramatically from, from well water to surface water. Are we in that right? Yes, that's correct. The uh, treatment plants have been being, the, with the surface water, have been being supplied with a lot more water this year because they're right. in pastures because of the late yeah. rain. So 13 was a, was a dry year? Right, very dry year. 13 and 14 were both very dry years. 13. Um, our treatment plant's still doing over 500 gallons a minute here in Boulder Creek, and we're still sending water down to Ben Loman and in that direction up to Ziani and all out there. Uh, we do have wells coming online right now, but. Yeah. And, and wells going off like Olympia 1 and, or 2 and 3? Well, Olympia 2 and 3 is off, and Olympia 2 is <coughs> right. Olympia, down two, Olympia 2 has started up this last month, actually. Oh, okay. started back then. Yeah. Years 13 and 14 were big drought years. And then the, the second question was on your, your page about overtime. Mm -hmm. Uh, and clearly, the, the big overtime consumer is leaks, which is not not surprising. Yes. But my question is this: if you if you take that figure and you, and you dollarize it and annualize it, you know, am I right in assuming that once we fix all of our uh, mains or, or most of our, uh, our piping uh, infrastructure problems, we will save approximately forty five thousand dollars a year? Because that's what we're spending just in overtime. It'll vary. I mean. Well, but I mean, is my thinking right or am I way off? The more we, the more pipe we replace, the more we'll save. <coughs> so you're thinking right, but we're we're doing the right thing for a lot of reasons, and one of them is overtime. Yeah, definitely, and that's just one of the costs associated with the leaks, obviously. But I guess I was surprised at how yeah. much that the, yeah. the over just the overtime for leaks is costing us. I feel like almost every days. one of the major leaks this last month happened to the poor guys on a Friday at like yeah. 4 p.m. Yeah, we had a couple late ones too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got, you're calling out a crew of two to four people. So, so I, my point is, we're we're spending a lot of money on infrastructure, but we're going to save a lot more money down the road. Definitely, and you know, one of James's pet projects is to go to time of use on pg and &E. Once you get the larger storage and larger mains, you can move more water in a shorter period. You can go on time of use and save a significant amount of pg and &E costs. Mm -hmm. That's that's costing us an awful lot just moving water. Around. Oh yeah, electricity works. Yeah, we pump. I mean, right now with the distribution system we have, we're pumping 24 hours in a lot of places. And then once we get the model done, that will piggyback onto that and help staff understand the system more so the trauma, <laughs> trauma error, and be able to help us cost even more. A couple questions. Um, on the uh, system-wide maintenance issues, you got service line replacement on Bear Creek. What, what does that service line replacement mean? That was uh, we only I didn't do a full, I didn't say full service line replacement on that one. It was uh, half of the service line out in Bear Creek Road. We had to replace half of the service line. The other half will have to be replaced later, but we didn't want to shut down both lanes of the road during the same time, and it's not leaking at this time. So we replaced the half that was leaking. But it was a main line, not a service line. To a no, customer. it was our service line going across the road to feed the meter. Gotcha. Coming off of the main line. Yeah, from the main to the meter. Okay, got it. Um, let's see. Uh, it'd be great to get, get graphs on Fall Creek. I, I look at that chart and I go, graphs help like the, like the groundwater. I, I really like these graphs for our wells. Because these actually show really good information very quickly, which is it looks like at least in some places groundwater levels are starting to go up a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, it takes a while. Yeah, it, it does. does. It does. But the last two years have definitely increased. There is one that dipped a lot, and 
not sure why, but, um, but most of them show a nice uh, general upward trend, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, on the um, bulk water, I noticed we're way down on bulk water. So the rainfall from the drought years, we I mean, will go way up. But even compared to last year, we're um, still way down. And then it's strictly uh, due to weather. And okay. but because okay. la last year was well, we've been down compared to 2017, which is a wet year. Too. Um, I'm um, not sure if we're seeing I, any changes in. Has a lot to do with. The marijuana grow operations. Let's <laughs> yeah, put it that way. With the new, um, what do you say? Legalized. Yeah, 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 regulations. So, but with the legalization, the licenses weren't given out to a lot of people to grow, and so there's not near as much growing in the valley as there was in the past. Yeah, and they clamped down on the illegal growth considerably too. Okay. And the last one was on the. Um, 811 locations. How much does that cost the district to do? I mean, I know it's free to the consumer, but it's not, can't be free to us. Um, uh, it's not. And I, I mean, when I look at um, last year, for example, uh, 1,500 locates. Yeah, so last year, 2017 and 2018, there's a lot of poll replacements. That pg e was doing so the majority of those I, I get that but how much does it cost us to do a locate do you know all depends on the locate i mean one a locate can cost a staff time of a half an hour or a locate can cost staff time of two and a half to three hours but i would not see i've never seen any locate go more than probably three hours okay so Bigger uh, bird, bird maintenance bird. staff person at three hours at the max and at a half hour at the least. Yeah, what's the burden rate for that? 50%. Well, I mean, what's the total dollar cost? Burden. It depends on the person that's going to be doing it. I mean, you have a quite take an average. Say 20 to 30 dollars probably yeah. for a half hour. About half hour. Yeah. Well, I'd say probably 50 dollars an hour. Sure. I was guessing 50 to 75. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a question, Ross? Yes. Yes. Uh, just to follow up on Bob's question, um, the well drawdown report, do we have, uh, can we go back further than 2015? Yes. Sure. And yeah. where would I find that information? Uh, just request it from James, and we've got them okay, considerably back. Thank you. It's just that you're out of room. Exactly. What, if, you, if you push them real scrunchy yeah. together, then you wouldn't be able to read it. Okay. How far back do you have that? Back right. to the conception of the well. The well okay. actual, so the they told the well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, history. Yeah. 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 At a graph level, you're really just looking for patterns. And again, it's right matter yeah. what the numbers are. Uh, okay. Can we move on? Is there questions out there? I have just one quick question, but it's not related to that. Um, I think earlier, I think Stephanie said something about the website, and that triggered a question in my mind. We were, we've had money in the budget over a couple of years now to improve the website, and, and I, I've seen some changes, but I wouldn't say that there's this new and improved well, website. Yeah, that we're in the yes. middle, of, an RFP was approved, a vendor was approved, and so we're working on it. It's going to be a completely new website. Yeah, that's what I thought. So the last admin committee we showed, um, some of the designs of it. It's going to be at next week's admin committee as well. But I mean, that's probably still six months out. It'll be a completely just totally different okay. website. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, committee reports. Do you want to comment or do we have a question? I have a question. Holly, I don't see the uh, engineering committee report for August. No, there was a problem with the recording, and oh. there is no. No recording? No recording, nothing. Well, there was, there was a lot that we reported. <laughs> but maybe we can, if Chuck was here, he possibly has it. He would give it to us, yeah. So there may not be an injury. Committee. I don't have any information for it, no. I want to recognize the Long 
Topeka Committee for doing what I think is outstanding work and putting together the report. It can't be easy. This is very comprehensive. So um, thank you. I know you've been working on that. Thank you for, for doing that. And I have one correction. Um, page 181, Paul. Um, the, the word in uh, BB should be underfunded. <coughs> I can get with you later on the specifics. It basically said that California public agencies are underfunded in pensions by $800 billion. So you're saying they're underfunded by uh, funded. 800. Underfunded. Yeah. yeah. I wish they were funded. They did tune up 800 billion, but no such a. Okay, anything else? Any other questions from the audience? In that case, I'd like to adjourn this meeting.